the idea that the brain is a computer and neurons are dumb on us, which is, is ridiculous. Uh, despite all the billions and trillions, and don't believe the hype because, you know, it's, I mean, AI does great things, so I'm not trashing AI. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grand America Show. We are going to be chatting with Stuart Hammerhoff a little bit later. Uh, it's a fun one, good one. Stuart's a mind blower. Uh, pretty much a lecture. We don't get a lot of talking in, but those are usually the ones you guys like the best anyway. <laughs> yeah, true that. Yeah, so uh, it's a good one. And we'll do a little intro here first with the one and only Graham. I'm addicted to podcast and Dunlop. No, I'm not. No? No. I still have a hard time doing it sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Got to get up for it. Got to get up for it. It's harder the day at work sometimes, and I'm like, oh, man, why are some of the most stressful days the day that you have to sort of snap out of it and start podcasting? Yeah, I don't mind that so much. For me, it's more in the morning when I first get out of bed. Because, like, I'm always super tired. I never want to get out of bed. I just don't like to want to get out of bed. If I, if I, I'm the type of person that I just like to get up on my own terms, which yeah. is really only about an hour later than I get up. Yeah. I agree, yeah. And I'd just wake up, and I would be so much better. Yeah. It'd be nice if you had a job that could do that. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't. So I have no. to get up before. Yeah. And I don't enjoy it. But I go through periods where I'm, when I'm not podcasting, where I really enjoy it. Like, I enjoy the thought of podcasting and, you know, chatting with these interesting people, but... But that's what Sometimes I'm when it comes time to that think, day, it's like, like oh, I'll be up late tonight. We'll be up till fucking eleven or twelve, you know, or you know, it's just yeah. like. But then by the end of the workday, I'm excited for it. Yeah, and it's and it's chatting with people like um, Stuart Hammerov here that make it all worth it, and of course our list, our listeners, and the feedback we get from from friends of the show and stuff. Because Stuart's great. I remember him from like ten, fifteen years ago on that movie what the bleep and what i've always wanted to chat with him so yeah it's great it was a gooder yeah so was, we ramble on here for a little bit about uh usually about half hour 45 minutes there's a there's a note in the show notes that says uh the time stamp to the interview if you need to skip forward and also there's a fast forward button i think that skips you to the next chapter you still doing the next chapter thing darren yes if you don't want to listen to this rambling you can go straight to the interview, and it's a pretty long one. I think it's almost two hours, I think. This one? I think, yeah, I think so. Yeah, about that. I had a couple long ones lately, the last two episodes. The Nancy Euro one was kind of short, you know? Yeah. But we bounced back with a couple, almost three hours. Yeah. So I got some feedback to read, and um, I thought I'd try and keep it a little bit close to um, to our topic of quantum consciousness with Stuart. What sort so of feedback? Kind of Jingle like, worthy feedback? Well, I have I have like a, some dreams and synchronicities, but stuff that kind of show that uh, we're not just uh, our brains, not just a computer. You know, kind of goes over and we above. We don't have a jingle for that. Well, you can choose dreams or um, synchro. The researcher believes that this neurosynchronicity occurs when the brains of musicians playing together create a neurological meta network. According to her, the phenomenon can be described as a kind of communal brain. Brain, 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 brain. I love that. There you go. How come we haven't heard that one in so long? It's on board two. It's on what? It's on board two. What is that? I really need a better soundboard app. You know, I'm really not super thrilled with the one I've got sometimes. But that's a pootie pie. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. That's really good. So spit it out. So what do I have, a synchronicity then? I don't know, you tell me. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so here's, here's an, I got a couple tiny ones here. This is Caleb, a fan of the show, following you on Instagram. Maybe a synchro. I have a little story for you. It was Saturday around 7.30. My head was tired from the weekend. Normally, I'm a late night person. Tonight was different. Sleep seemed to call to me. I think I read this already. You might have to I'll edit let you this know. out. I let it take me over, instantly fell into vivid dreams. I woke back up around 11 p.m. thinking to myself, apparently, I'm going to dream tonight. Since I have a strong ability to control my dreams, and this night seemed to be a dreaming night, I focused my thoughts towards a message. I wanted to learn something tonight. 
instead of just playing around with no purpose in the dream realm. With that thought in mind, I fell back to the place. This time the storyline was different. I was sucked back into old mindsets and mentalities. The storyline was me being back of fishing again. Which I very did so much enjoy. No, what did he say? Which I very much so did not enjoy in reality or in dream. Fishing? Yeah. I like fishing. Fuck! That reminds me. I keep forgetting to sign up for the wall I draw. Trying to they swear up, loudly like that. There's they, a wall I draw in, in Northern opened, Ontario? They're open, no, they opening up 12 lakes in Alberta. Oh, wow. For walleye fishing. Oh, wow. But it's all by lottery. Really? So I need to try and get in there. So I need somebody that, uh, somebody text Savvy to tell me how to make a bot army. That so I can, you can go fishing for walleye? Yeah. In Alberta, the many lakes. Yeah, I mean, Alberta. that'll be Where's the, the nearest lake here? I mean, uh, this is, we're not whatever. even. You commute. Besides you commute, your little bitch. man-made You drive lake. all over the fucking countryside <laughs> pissing in bottles for less, okay? <laughs> okay, go do your fishing. I'm going to, but I could use a bot army for all sorts of things besides fishing. You don't want a bot, I don't awards. agree with that. I think that's terrible. Like all these mainstream news organizations with bots and people like. You, no, you those are do. fake followers. Those aren't bot armies. Bot armies you use to fuck shit up. You could send your bot army after CNN and crash your website. That's the kind of bot army I want. But I don't know how to make it. But I next want to bake, make it for me. And just give me control of it. Can we talk about that on a different episode besides okay. the one with Stuart Hamilton? <laughs> <laughs> Stuart would probably not approve of the bot army. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to the dream. So the overwhelming feeling of being trapped at sea filled my whole mental state. I was there again. Nowhere to go. Only four inches of fiberglass separated me from the ocean. Like a bad trip, I couldn't get out in my mental state would only repeat and repeat. The slight sensation of knowing it was just a dream kept me from being too overwhelmed with reliving the experience. Then I woke up to my alarm clock for work. It was over. For me, dreams like that will linger with me for a couple hours. The feeling was still with me at work. Even while I stared at the foreman, somehow it didn't even feel real. My phone buzzed in my pocket. It was a friend offering me a job on a boat this coming summer. <laughs> I haven't heard from him in a couple months because he's out fishing. I hadn't previously considered fishing this summer or even thought about it at all. Hopefully this will make some sense to you in some crazy way. Thought it was pretty crazy coincidence, maybe a synchro. I'm a big fan of your show, guys. Thanks for everything you do and the knowledge you spread. P.S. I found you on Spotify. I live in Alaska, so we're like neighbors. Word up. I wonder if he's talking about like commercial fishing yeah probably yeah it's probably different yeah it's probably not as fun just netting fish out of the ocean yeah <laughs> catching them thanks caleb yeah so at least two caleb's that listen to the show yeah actually we don't know that caleb hanks listens no we don't know probably doesn't caleb if you listen you better let me know oh i gotta here's another good one i think this is from a local guy Local Just, guy? Yeah. Synchrotastic. Synchrotastic? Yeah. I wow. Thought, I thought I'd share this one. You know this is his favorite jingle. I'm a rambling grand. It's everybody's. Synchronicity yeah. all over the web. Actually, I'm not 100% sure. It'd be interesting to know everyone's favorite jingle because it seems to be between that one, social media jangle, and... Uh, Graham is an all-in believer in chemtrails. Yeah, of course. And most of these jingles the are done only by, one, by listeners of the show. The only one that's been turned into a ringtone is the chemtrail one, and it's happened four times. Wow. You have to show me how to do that. Maybe I'll put it on my I don't know how to do it. You I just send really? people the MP3. <laughs> really? You do? Well, I'm sure I can figure it out. No, but you do send people the audio from yeah. it? Okay. So, yeah, um, if anyone wants a jingle, they just ask me. I'll send it to them. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if it's that one. I think it's a great ringtone. So he says, hey, hey, man, thought I'd share this one. It's pretty neat. I was having a conversation this afternoon about the relevance of the trinities and threes throughout religion and different belief systems, where in the course of the conversation, an idea I was familiar with hit me with total clarity. The way that you... 
the way that things do when you suddenly take an old idea and it takes on a whole other level of meaning and application in life. Three is the smallest number of points required when you connect them. You create something. In the case of two dimensions, a triangle is the first shape that creates an observable space on the page, for example. All this linked back to metaphysics and traditions and how we actually create reality all the time. But the context on that discussion totally gelled an idea inside me in a way that I had never done before. I'm not sure if it's being explained clearly here. It's most likely not, but that hardly matters. It's not the point of this email. Here's the synchro. I listen to podcasts in a sort of as-they-come schedule because I'm subscribed to a few regular shows, none of which are anything like yours, you know. I think he's being sarcastic there. So, so one will just run into the next one, and I don't really fuss about which one comes next. I just try to stay up to date with them. Anyway, I left that conversation and got, got in my truck and hit play for the podcast player for my drive home. And what episode should come on? I'm, what is this, a fucking guessing game? <laughs> I was yeah, hoping that you were paying attention enough to guess. That's right, the one about the power of shapes. Specifically, I would have never guessed that. Sp- specifically, st- starting off with an explanation of triangles. Bam! Not exactly a mind bender, but definitely worth sharing. Have a rad week, you guys. Rad. I like the rad. I love that. Um, I love that. Imagine that. Yeah, you know, it's weird that, and then you get it on. Boom. Didn't we just get? Because we never get cash donations. And you randomly got two cards to the PO box in the last week with thirty three dollars. Yeah, yeah. I want to thank the two listeners who supported with three thirty three dollars of U.S. cash donations and that's like that one arrived of, at the same time. That's like one out of like what five cash donations you've gotten in four years. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Uh, maybe a couple more. I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, that's weird. Not a lot though, but yeah, that's pretty crazy. Huh. It reminds me of the one, do you remember my big synchro about the Hawks way back a couple of years ago? Mike Hawk? Mike Hawk, that one. Yeah. And how I got from, um, I was looking at the researcher, um, oh man, I'm going to forget his name. Jordan Hawk or no. something Hawk? Um, 12 Hawk? Jonathan Hawk. Yeah. And then I got into my car and I was listening to this long audio book. Yeah, and then you drudge. Drive, drove your bike uh-huh. past the hawk and it looked you in that the eye. That was all before that. <laughs> <laughs> you guys shared a moment. See, you remember, you remember the details of my My memory is phenomenal. Anyways, when, you, I, if, when if, I got if, in the if car. If you can get past the first, like. The short term. The first, the like, 36 part. hours, you're gold. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyways, I turned on the audiobooks right smack in the middle and it says, Researcher Jonathan Hawk. Yeah, and yeah. that was the first it was ever mentioned. If they want to hear the synchro a little more, you can go back to the uh, Len Caston episode. No, it wasn't that one. <laughs> yeah, what? No, it wasn't. Yeah. No. I think so. Keep I talking. Don't know. Anyways, that's that's it, man. That's it for that one. That's it. Yeah. I'm not really super. Um. Oh yeah, here we go. When did we interview Len Cast and shit? That was a long time ago. Was that before we numbered him? That was before the igloo. That was when we were in your basement. This house? Yeah. Yeah. For some reason I was on the wrong side of the table at that time too, right? Oh, those are the producer Joe days. Yeah. I don't even think producer Joe even listens to the show anymore. Uh Robert Carlson, Robert Wagner. Rick Strassman, Dan Carlin. Hey, when is the next, uh, does does Rennie still listen to the show? When's the next uh, One Great Year coming out? I'm not sure. Dave McGowan, the late Dave McGowan. Oh, Gallenberger. Wow, this, I'm going back there. Len Caston, June 7th, 2014. I mentioned Gallenberger to somebody in the chat room. Oh, which did we did we talk about the chat? No. No, we didn't. Still a vote, um, and then the power will go out and I'll be ready for a couple of months. <laughs> Breeze Bois. Yeah, yeah, Breeze Bois. Don't, so that's don't, a good don't news. Flip through all that. We're just not scare away. Okay, so I'm riding my bike. 
This is how it starts. I'm riding my bike uh, past Nose Hill Park. It's okay, a okay, park okay. That's enough. Okay, you want me to replay the synchro? Pathway no. along the side of it. What is that music playing? There's a metal railing there. So I'm riding up, and ahead I see this this big bird on the standing. Okay, okay. No, okay. no, 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 no. We, we need the recap. I thought it was an owl at no, first. No, 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 it's not an owl. It kind of looks like a golden eagle, or it's a. It's as I got closer, it was definitely a raptor type bird. No, I can't right? handle it anymore. I can't listen to so, my own saying well, on my own show. Like right on the How would you to rate it? I'm quietly riding up to it, and, I, and I'm no, thinking, no, no, come <laughs> on. It's go, it goes on for a while. I can't, I yeah, can't do it. it gets, what episode is it though? I'll link to it in the show notes. America talks to Lancaster. Really? <laughs> How did you? How did you even remember that? I didn't. I told you I have a phenomenal memory. You don't have to listen to the to the Lancaster part of it. Whoa, whoa, bro! This one doesn't even go all the way down to half speed. Just don't. Or I'm thinking to it, kind of. They don't <laughs> don't be scared. Don't okay, be come scared. on. Right. I'm just gonna ride by. So I can tell, telepathically communicate with <laughs> her. Are you on half just speed? Natural. It's just a natural thing. Like, don't be scared. Don't be scared. Like you would say, maybe it is a natural thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's on three quarter speed. Yeah. And whatever you do out there, don't play it on anything less than one. What about more? Can I play it on more? Maybe. So anyways, I, I ride by it and I look to it, I look at it, and it's looking at me from like a foot or two away in the eyes as I, as I ride by it and I just get this full like body shiver like, oh, shit. and of course I wanted to stop and look at it or do something, but I just kept riding, right, because it's just watching me drive right by it. So I didn't even know what kind of bird this was, right, I tried to get it. <laughs> uh. Can I continue? Okay, I'll try and get myself together here. I whipped that up pretty quick, actually. That was good, yeah, that was good. Now people wow. assume the show is scripted and we have ads and it's all native ads. Native ads. Selling squatty potties. Yeah. You know so, what? I found out that people do actually sell squatty potties on podcasts. Really? So turns do they out sell the accusation them for was, people? Turns out the accusation was valid. Because I don't feel like my squatty you gotta get potties the nine are inch. Really doing that. You gotta get the nine inch. I'll take your seven inch for my other toilet. Okay. Then you buy me a nine inch and I'll yeah. trade you. Yeah. I'm not finding the squatty potty working very throw, well. Throw a couple books under it, get it up to nine inches, and see what happens. No, I don't want to put books in the bathroom. Well, get it up to things. nine inches and see if that's the problem. I don't feel like stacking anything on the washing floor, really. What are you, fucking Seinfeld? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on. It's degrading fast. <laughs> the wheels are coming off. So, do you want a do you want a dream dream prediction? Another dream yes. prediction on it? Yes. Okay. This is from Selena. Oops! Whoa, 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 whoa! That wasn't the one. Did I actually? No. Is it real or a dream? What does that even mean? This is one of these crazy ones. That, you know, some people just did you know Harold predict really me detailed dreams to delete the backup of the show if I didn't start being nicer to you. <laughs> Thanks, Harold. <laughs> so, Two Gray America found your show by searching "Ancient Aliens" about three or four months ago on SoundCloud. Actually, um, I, would just, I do want to mention someone found us on fucking SoundCloud. Yeah. You're not still paying for that, are you? I am still paying for it. Yeah, it comes out of our monthly. Well, it comes out of my. <laughs> Is that still no, adding in the bill that the show was you? Just delete it. No, it, Selena found us on SoundCloud. I don't think I even it. put this stuff on there anymore. You better. Yeah, you should. It's still there. Okay, right. we'll, we'll Remind look at that. Look at okay, what we'll show look at episode that. is she talking about? I don't know. We'll, one? we'll find out here. Anyways, it is good to hear how people found us. There's, there's people finding us on Spotify and SoundCloud and stuff. It's pretty cool to know. It's, good. it's weird to know how, pe- what pe- how do people find you on SoundCloud? She's just like tiptoed into a whole world of podcasts that she clearly did not know about before. I would well, maybe, well, maybe not. Go into iTunes and take make that same search. So she says, um, having been missing that show, I think they had it pulled from the History Channel, and I used to watch what? it on or the Alien Con that they had was last for them. Not sure. 
almost through all your episodes, don't know what I'm going to do when I run out. <laughs> have gotten four others so far hooked on your show, too. Anyways, love your show. So depending on where she's listening to the show, there might be way more episodes than she thinks. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So try like iTunes or YouTube. I'm going to check right or now. Or the website even. So in the middle, uh, I'll, keep, I'll keep going on here. So your voices definitely don't seem to match what I'd pictured, but to get to the point, I've had some lucid dreams that seem to be much more than dreams. Well, look, they're all here. Oh, yeah? Okay, good. Two plays, six plays, 16. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> In fact, there have been so many actual predictions from these dreams that I've started to write them down, and now I have a couple notepads full of them. So get this. For several years, I've thought it's been the spirits that have been visiting me, or spirit guides, but I'm unsure. I've been told about pregnancies and roundabout ways of deaths that have always been true. Don't want to make this too long, so I'll tell you about one that really stood out for me. I have a sort of diff distant type grandmother on my aunt's side by marriage. She had a boyfriend for many years. I didn't really know him. And about two years ago, he passed when he did, when he did about three days after his passing, I had the most vivid detailed dream ever about him. He showed me the inside of his church, that the church was in his backyard in the dream where he wanted to be buried. And he showed me where he lived the furniture he had in his house where he kept pictures of his grandkids. And it was full. Of, it was a pic of all of them sitting on the floor, looking up at the camera, the TV, a wooden one that sat on the floor, like the ones they had back in the eighties, even showed me his favorite channel. It was some sort of QVC type channel. You buy stuff from, I remember it plain as day. It was situated that when you walked in the front door, there was a small hallway. Then to your left, there's a Brown couch on the right of the Brown couch was a TV and to the left was a China hutch with knickknacks and a little further to the left was another part of the couch and a small window that led in sunlight. There was a young energetic teen, maybe 16 or 17 with super curly blonde hair giggling and sitting on the couch and said, Oh, you know, dad, he always keeps $500 in his lunchbox. I've never in my life been to his home. When I brought this dream to grandma, she confirmed every bit of it, even had an idea as to who the teen was in the dream. The only part was the dollars in the vault, not a lunchbox. This is just one of so many. What do you guys think? But do love your show and plan on telling many more friends about it, as well as sending a donation. Would be awesome to see you guys on a live podcast. Let me know when you come to Washington. That would be lots of fun to hang out. Sincerely, Selena. We're in Washington. Oh, I don't know if that's that Washington, maybe. D.C.? Anyways, what do you think about the dream predictions? The notebook's full of them. Actually, I think that her writing them down helps her remember them as well. Yeah, guaranteed. Yeah, Lisa was trying to write some down. She had a journal beside the bed. It's hard. Yeah. I tell you, best with voice notes. Sure. Um... <laughs> Yeah, it's weird how dreams tend to do that. They tend to do that. But some Especially people tend those to be so when, much better at it than others. Could she, I wonder if she could have been a baby then. What does that, that mean? That she was a baby. That was a baby memory. That'll well, possibly. she's never been there. Unless she went there when she was a baby? Hmm. Or never. If it's never, then it's weirder. Yeah, definitely. It's all but he pa it was a few days after he passed, too, so that's interesting how maybe he dropped off some. some yeah, that her. could have been it, for sure. It's all one, baby. Well, I've been thinking about this theory, too. I had one in the in the uh, steam the, room the other day. On mushrooms? No, just in the steam room, like after a workout. And um, I was thinking about, I, I don't know if I even want to talk about it on this yet. It's not really fully formulated. Oh boy! But you know how when we, get, you know how we talked to Stuart about his theory about, or not his theory, but you know about how life could survive after death by the quantum coherence of the entangled particles, like basically the microtubules being entangled. And I thought, what if it's not all or nothing? What if, what if you could, if you could be consciously or subconsciously entangling 
your particles are making them more coherent so that when you do die, that energy stays together and it, it, and it can go into another life with the memories, the past life memories. But what if you, what if you don't entangle them? Like what if you're just distracted and you're not meditating or not like actually trying to build coherence in your quantum soul, let's say that some of those particles don't make it like it's not a fully entangled soul do you know what i mean so then you just reincarnate as a douchebag well then then you don't have that full like like maybe the maybe the goal is is to not a lot of douchebags maybe the goal is to is to cohere and entangle as much as you can so that you keep memory remembering more and more and you you build up that spiritual like sort of like a level do you really want to remember up. the last kind of like life level up you want to start again and remember the shit yeah i would you would yeah, anyways, let's move on. I kind of wanted to write all that down before sharing it. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I do want to uh, mention the the uh, announcement, uh, the Penrose Institute announcement that uh, Stuart emailed me right afterwards. So I want to read, read it here. Sure. Uh, do you want me to do that now? You may as well. <clears throat> so uh, this is... Um, the Roger Penrose Institute is to form in San Diego, and it will examine the interplay between quantum mechanics and general relativity with implications for AI and understanding of consciousness. So a unique institute is being formed to develop and investigate the forward-thinking ideas of eminent British physicist Sir Roger Penrose. To be based in San Diego, with collaborations in Lung London and Oxford and Tucson, Arizona, the Institute will examine the interplay between quantum mechanics and general relativity. And da, 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 I just said all that. The fundamental difference between artificial and human intelligence, how humans should best work with AI, insights on the nature of consciousness, new approaches to treatment of mental and cognitive disorders, a novel type of telescope to image dark matter and the distant universe, a sensor to discover natural resources and dangers in the Earth's crust, and a resolution of the Schrodinger's cat paradox. Sir Roger's uh, ideas on the importance of quantum effects in human consciousness were intriguing and inspirational when first described 30 years ago now, but they drew skeptical criticism particularly to the suggestion that exotic slash functional quantum effects could be present in living tissue at warm temperatures. However, new discoveries in biology show that exotic functional quantum effects are present in living systems. For example, photosynthesis in plants and potentially some forms of bird navigation depend on them. Also, recent developments allow us to probe neurons at scales that might reveal quantum behavior and to produce sensors capable of measuring the interplay between quantum and relativistic effects. As a, re as a result, a group of scientists, entrepreneurs, and philanthropists are joining forces with Sir Roger to develop and experimentally test these theories in a new institute. Huh. Practical experiments are planned which should lead to the development of biomedical technologies to study deeper level quantum vibrational processes inside neurons, inside neurons, to improve understanding of brain functions and treatment of brain disorders. Computational technologies to better allow computers and humans to work together. Sensor technologies to detect subtle gravitational effects to peer into the earth. Detecting natural resource, the inner Earth. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you got that. And providing early warning of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Or out into space to give a picture of the early universe and distribution of dark matter. <laughs> That's interesting, eh? I'll have I to like keep it. an eye on that guy, on that one. <clears throat> a shizzle. <laughs> so a link to that will be in the show notes. <laughs> Speaking of the show notes, do all the other stuff in the show notes too while you're there. Uh, mainly check out grammarica.ca slash support and uh, sign up for a monthly subscription if you can. Those really do uh, are the easiest to uh, work with for sure. If you can't afford that, maybe you can do a one-time donation. But there are options there anywhere from a buck a month to uh, right up to 30 bucks a month. I think we've, we've got someone at just about every level. Um, <clears throat> we got the chat room too now. 
Did we mention that? We were going to... At grammarica.ca slash hangout to get in the chat. I think there's already yeah. like a hundred people in there. Yeah, it's just a perpetual group chat. That's kind of interesting. There's been some really funny stuff in there so, so yeah, far. It's like basically now anytime you pop in there, except for the chat seems to shut down from about... Uh, Oh, it varies. About 2 a.m. till about, before, for, after I go to bed and before I wake up, it seems to be going. Which is cool. Right yeah. now there's, let's see, right now, James, James Cruz, Grim Steak are having a conversation about Poltergeist. What else we got here? It looks like uh, Scott. Yeah, that's been fun. These guys are like best friends in there. Yeah. It's and awesome. It- I mean, it's fun because we can pop in there from time to time and interact with you guys on kind of a way more casual level. I've been posting random pictures from my phone every day. Yeah, and it helps uh, when you guys give us feedback too and review the to- review the show on iTunes for sure. Yeah, tell us how absolutely. you found us, and tell some friends. Yeah, and don't forget the UFO quote. I got it open here, ready to go. You do? Yeah. So check out the Hangout. Check out grammarica.ca slash support, guys. Uh, sign up for a month. They do a one-time donation. Big thanks to those of you who do. Uh, still got zero feedback on anyone that wants us to do anything about it. So no. about oh, did, oh, about did you get any feedback on that? About, about how we could honor our subscribers? Yeah, they, they said our... that we shouldn't say them by name. I had feedback from somebody that said that. I don't think we ever do say them by name, do we? No, but there, did you remember we oh, asked yeah, for yeah, feedback yeah. and she's giving us, or he or don't, whoever it is. Don't say her. They are giving us feedback. Z? They. Singular? Sure. Okay. Let's see, now it's confusing. I don't know what they means. I know. Well, that's why I said it. <laughs> um, there's some hate, though. Yeah, so we'll figure something out, or we won't, or whatever. Anyway, check it out. Uh, check out grammarca.ca slash news, uh, sign up for the newsletter. Uh, there is, you do get that. You don't get it instantly. Justin <laughs> will send it to you within a couple of days after you sign up for the newsletter. Uh, grammarca.ca slash news. Of course, the, uh, cabin debacle episode is on there. And, um, yeah, I think that's it, right? Yep. Leave a review, yep. blah, blah, blah. All that jazz. Darren and Graham are going deep. We don't want to ask, have to ask you guys to do this, but we need to ask you guys to do this. How about the, All the, about stuff, the donations? Yeah, the donations and the yeah, reviews. We, have to. And we, the, don't, we don't have ads, and we sunk quite a bit into this, so, yeah. It's a profound UFO quote of the week. Now it's going to stick in everybody's head. So this is, uh, I know I'm not crazy. I've always said I didn't believe in this stuff. I don't know what I saw, but I know I saw something. It's just hard to describe what happened. It looked like an evening star or something, but it kept getting bigger and brighter. I heard a whirring noise, like a blender, like it was straining when you first put ice in it. And then the UFO started coming closer. The thing came right over the car. It came right to us, like it was being piloted. The thing just hovered over us about 20 to 30 feet up for more than a minute. There was light coming out from the little windows, and the light changed color several times, from soft blue to red to green and other colors. It didn't spin or anything. It just hovered around there. Then the thing just picked up and took off, northwest, toward Satarsha. And that quote was from Madison County Sheriff's Deputy Kenneth Creel, Flora, Mississippi, United States, February 10th, 1977, and the object was also witnessed by Highway Patrolman Luis Younger. Hmm. There you have it. Yep, that was a good one. No, my SSI, SSI, PPI? Yep. Hmm. Right on? Right on, buddy. Is that it? Yep. That's it? That's it. All right, guys. Uh, enjoy the chat with Stuart. I think you will. Do all the stuff in the show notes. And, uh, yeah. Enjoy Stuart. He was a great one. What was that documentary he was on way back in the day? What the bleep do we know? Yeah. I remember watching that shit way back in the day. It was kind of a game changer. Yeah. All right, guys. Enjoy.
have Dr. Stuart Hameroff here today. He's a director of Center for Consciousness Studies, a professor emeritus, Department of Anesthesiology, the College of Medicine at the University of Arizona, Department of Psychology. And he's a quantum consciousness theorist and researcher. I first found out about his work um, in the movie What the Bleep and uh, sort of been wanting to chat with him ever since. And it's really good to have you on. Thanks for coming on, Stuart. My pleasure, Graham. Nice to hear from you guys. Yeah, it's great. I mean, honestly, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know where to start because there's so much to to talk <laughs> about. Uh, I was reading up on, on your research and uh, some of your blogs and and uh, I, I always feel like I want to start with like what's new, but um, a lot of times people are used to sort of going back and giving giving a bit of a, a history on um, on your research. So, do you feel like uh, going back, or do you want to just jump into some of the yeah, new I can, stuff? Uh, let me let me just wing it. Uh, how I got interested and uh, how I got to where I am. Uh, uh, yeah, I, let's uh, do that. Well, first of all, let me let me just say that most people look at consciousness as a, uh, a computation. They look at the brain as a computer, yeah. and the brain is made of, uh, what is it, 86 billion neurons that are connected by thousands of synapses, each having thousands of synapses, making a kind of a network that's adaptable and changeable. The synapses can change plasticity, yeah. and so there's, the network can change configuration, and information flows through this network, and somehow consciousness happens. Right. So the assumption has always been that the brain is a computer. And the neurons are just like simple bits, uh, on-off switches. They're actually integrate and fire threshold logic devices, a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Hudson, Hudson neuron. But basically, a computer. And ignoring, you know, that neurons are alive, and we don't really know what that means yet. And uh, uh, accordingly, this general idea that I've been, which is not my idea, the, the mainstream idea, that the brain is a computer, uh, jives with artificial intelligence ideas who are trying to build uh, computers that act like brains, that have intelligence and maybe even consciousness, yeah. although they won't exactly say why well, I would be conscious. So the brain, uh, brain, uh, brain, mind, computer comparison is very popular and has led to things like the singularity, which says that uh, you know you have a, uh, roughly 100 billion neurons with 1,000 synapses, which in 100 times a second gives you 10 to the 16th operations per second. And that when we have computers that will do 10 to the 16th operations per second, we'll have brain equivalents and therefore consciousness. So just give us another uh, couple billion or 10 billion and we'll have it for you. <laughs> and they keep pushing the goalpost for that because nothing's happened. In fact, uh, rather than wait for uh, 86 billion neurons, the human brain project like uh, uh, Henry Markram in, in Switzerland was doing, uh, then Christoph Koch has a uh, more modest mouse cortex, which only has uh, 20 billion, I forget exactly. Um, some people said, hey, wait a second, we have this worm. We have this worm called C. elegant, yep. flat worm. It, it swims around, it does all kinds of stuff. And about 15 years ago, the uh, entire nervous system of the worm was mapped. So we already know every neuron and every synapse, and I think even every ion channel in the nervous system, brain, if you will, of mm -hmm. the worm which is no genius, but can swim around and do functional things and find a mate and find food and, and uh, avoid predators and so forth. Yeah. And, uh, you know, let's start with that. So uh, they started this project mapping the, it's called Open Worm. They, they got online and got people around the world uh, simulating this, this nervous system. And uh, we're going to uh, announce the day where they were going to have a simulated uh, worm and they were going to press the button and it would go swimming around and, and look like a worm. And that day it came and went, and nothing happened. And it turns out, reading between the lines mostly, that it's been a big flop. The, the simulated worm, despite the fact that every neuron in synapse is, is uh, simulated, doesn't do anything. There's no behavior. Suggesting there's something missing in this idea. And that's the key point I want to make. The idea that the brain is a computer and neurons are dumb on us, which is, is ridiculous. Uh, despite all the billions and trillions. And don't believe the hype, because, you know, I mean, AI does great things, so I'm not trashing AI. I'm just saying the idea that AI will automatically lead to consciousness is, is, is hype. Yeah. And a better example, think, uh, I mean, the idea that each neuron is just a simple integrated fire device, there's several re uh, problems with that. If, if you look at individual neurons in awake animals, uh, the, it, there's some other variable that, that regulates firing, there's some other added feature probably coming from inside the neuron, and that would be where you'd want consciousness to come in to regulate firing. 
But if you think about once the neuron is one cell, think about a paramecium. It's one. It's one neuron. Okay. The the worm I mentioned had 302 neurons. I think I forgot to say that. Yeah. So you have this 302 uh, neuron brain of a worm. You simulate every every neuron, every synapse. You know, roughly a thousand times that, and nothing happens. Um, as an even more stark example, if you go to a, a even smaller one cell animal like a paramecium, yeah. it swims around, it finds food, uh, it it finds a mate, it actually has sex, it can avoid obstacles, and it can learn. If you suck it into a capillary tube, it gets out faster and faster each time. So the paramecium with one cell, which would be like one bit in the AI approach, yeah. is actually pretty darn clever. And I keep asking my AI friends, you know, simulate a paramecium. Yeah. And, of course, they don't take the bait because that would mean it would have to be one bit. You'd probably, you know, I don't know how many bits you would need and even then whether it would work. But it just shows that the idea that, that one, one neuron, one bit is ridiculous. You think so it's 10 to 1? So how does the paramecium do it? Or do, you think it, do you think it's like 10 to 1 or 100 to 1, or do you think it's like infinite? Which, the, uh, it, it's, it's, there's something qualitatively different. I mean, you can have, I think you can have, you know, a Google number of neurons, uh, of dumb switches. You have the, the computer that can do almost anything in, you know, in raw data, but that would not make it conscious. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and the, the idea that whatever it's doing is based on strictly computation is probably wrong, too, because how would you explain what a, what a paramecium could do? And why can't you explain the worm? So there's something else going on. And it almost has to be at a deeper level, I think, in, inside the neuron or inside the paramecium. And if you look at how a paramecium gets around, it, it has these little hair-like things that stick out, look like, like little ores and sensors called cilia. Yeah. And they're, they're in all of our cells, and they're basically little barrels made up of these structures called microtubules. Yeah. And microtubules are the backbone, the skeleton in, about, in all of our cells. Uh, and because neurons are so asymmetrical, they have, they're very dependent on their asymmetrical cytoskeleton, the microtubules, and they're very prevalent. There's about, a, uh, and microtubules are polymers of structures called, uh, of proteins called tubulin, and there's about a billion tubulins per neuron. Wow. So, it, and, and these tubulins can switch at pretty fast. Actually, they, they, they have resonances at a bunch of different frequency scales. And this is where it really gets interesting. Interesting because you have all these almost musical resonances going on in these protein uh, polymers inside neurons, and inside all cells, but in, in uh, neurons, they're, they're, they're especially orchestrated. And, uh, and you have these resonances that, that, across, that repeat at different frequency ranges, kind of like music, where you have high-frequency uh, instruments and middle-frequency and then low-frequency, and they resonate across scale and, and make music. And I think music is actually a better analogy for consciousness than is uh, the computer. computer. Yeah. I, think, uh, I think the brain is more like an orchestra than a computer, and I think consciousness is more like music uh, than it is a computation. Because if it's a computation, who's going to you know, look at it? Who's, you, know, you need the observer. And I think uh, if you say that the music itself is conscious in some way, that actually goes a, goes a long way. And and I think that the these frequencies, these resonant repeating frequencies that start in microtubules at high frequencies of 10 to the 12 hertz, terahertz, which are these quantum vibrations where anesthetics act, and then you skip about three orders of magnitude to um, uh, gigahertz, and then you skip another, uh, which is the 10 to the 9th, billion oscillations per second. Then you skip another three to megahertz, uh, 10 to the six, a million, and skip another uh, three, you get to kilohertz, and you skip another three, and you get to hertz, which is EEV. And Roger Penrose and I uh, have, have believe and actually proposed in re several recent papers that EEV, which everybody has been using for 100 years, and we still don't understand uh, its origin and significance, we think that EEG is like a B frequency of these faster vibrations. You know, in music, if you have two guitars that are slightly out of sync, they'll give a beat and at a much slower rate. And we think these microtubules in dendrites in particular uh, are interfering in giving beats that give rise to EEG. So we see EEG and, and, uh, and levels of organization more like music and the brain more like an orchestra. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. <clears throat> and uh, it's not only important for the 
the AI and the singularity sort of crowd. But I mean, the we're living in this this world right now where materialism is still it still sort of rules rules the roost, right? And and we have even though people are having all these different experiences and and all, there's all this science, uh, like the stuff that you guys are doing is out there, but we're still stuck in this in this paradigm. But you guys really tread that middle ground, right? Between you know, the, not not so much the the woo woo spiritual part and and not materialism, but you've got this theory of that everything at the finest level, I guess, is vibration and resonating, right? And it's uh, yeah, and at the quantum level, I mean, that's that's the key thing when you talk about materialism, matter. You know, matter is very transient. Matter, uh, if you look at it at a small scale, if you look at a large scale, everything averages out, so everything's kind of solid and stable. If you look at the small scale, atoms and, and even small molecules and, and, and subatomic particles, electrons and so forth, are generally their natural state is quantum superposition. Right. Uh, which means that they're not at any one place or state at the same time. They're actually in multiple places. You can think of them as smeared out like a wave with several peaks, or in two places at once, or multiple places at once, quantum superposition. But we don't see that in our classical world. Uh, we see everything in one place, and this is known as the, uh, and the question of why we don't see that is, is the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Yeah. When uh, uh, Niels Bohr and uh, von Neumann, uh, the quantum pioneers at the beginning of the 20th century, discovered superposition, they realized from various ways that things can be in multiple states or locations, and this is the beginning of, of quantum theory, um, but, when they, but they didn't see it. We don't see it, and when they, even when they make a measurement uh, with a machine, the superposition collapses. So rather than a, a, a particle being here and there, it, when it, you observe it, it, it is either here or there. Whereas before, it is here and there. So um, somehow observation, either with the machine or with a human, causes the superposition, the wave function, which would describe it, to collapse or reduce to one state or the other. So, um, and then uh, Wigner had this idea that even if a machine measured a quantum superposition, the results in the machine would stay in superposition until a human or a conscious observer looked mm. at the results. Right. Uh, which and this led to the idea uh, that consciousness collapses the wave function. The consciousness causes the collapse, causes multiple possibilities to reduce to one or the other, and that uh, that tied consciousness to quantum mechanics, and they're still kind of stuck. Uh, although I think that that approach is actually backwards. Uh, the problem with that approach, that consciousness causes collapse, resolves resolves uh, a lot of problems and allowed Bohr and others to go, go on their merry way and do a lot of great work without worrying about the underlying reality. Whereas Einstein was more concerned with the nature of the underlying reality. I mean, how could you explain something being in two states at the same time or two places at the same time? Uh, Bohr, Bohr and those guys, they didn't care. They wanted to do the experiments, and rightfully so, because they were you know, earth-shattering. Uh, and they just said, well, we just assume that uh, the observer causes collapse. Uh, the problem with that is, though, that it puts consciousness outside of science. It says uh, we have this weird entity out here that whenever it, it shows up, uh, superpositions collapse to one or the other. So it didn't, didn't attempt to uh, explain consciousness. It just kind of used it as a, as a tool to explain away the, the, the measurement problem and the superposition problem. Hmm. But that's, and that became known as the Copenhagen interpretation because after Niels Bohr, who was from uh, Denmark, Copenhagen. And the consciousness causes collapse of the wave function, but that doesn't explain consciousness. Now, there's some other explanations for the uh, resolution of the measurement problem. For example, uh, that collapse superposition never disappears; it never collapses, and that each possibility branch evolves to its own universe. So, uh, the particle being here would evolve, and there'd be a, a universe with the particles in that state, and then another, the other, the there universe would evolve, so the particles in that state. And then the branching happens again and again and again, and you have this infinite number of multiple worlds overlapping universe, parallel universe. And as ludicrous as that seems, at least to me and many others, it's a very popular idea because it gets you around the measurement problem. You don't have to worry about superpositions because they just keep 
you form your own new universes, and you don't need to worry about consciousness to collapse the wave function. Because the wave function, function uh, doesn't collapse. Uh, you just keep making new universes. So the multiple worlds, uh, you know, sacrifices the, um, the, the metaphysical baggage of an infinite number of universes to avoid collapse and consciousness. I think it's, it's a cop-out. It's untestable. And uh, it's very popular. It goes with string theory, which is another, uh, I think, bogus idea. Uh, well, the strings aren't bogus. It's the multiple dimensions that are required, as Roger Penrose says. Right. So anyway, multiple worlds is, uh, is another one. And then um, um, decoherence, the idea that uh, any quantum superposition will, uh, will uh, run into a classical state and lose its uh, quantum state. Uh, um, Zurich and Tegmark and those guys, but that doesn't make sense either because at that level everything's quantum. So why, why would there be collapse? I mean, they don't even they don't even claim that the collapse disappears. They just say, well, you can't see it anymore. So that's another that's another cop out in my opinion. So and then there's a few others, and then uh, and then Roger Penrose came up with I think the one that makes the most sense. It's not the most popular. And I think uh, multiple worlds is most popular, but uh, you know it's basically absurd and untestable, and shouldn't even count as science. But nonetheless, it's it's out there. But Roger kind of turned. Well, he started by saying, um, by asking, what does it mean for a particle, particle, any particle, to be in superposition, to be in two states, two or more states at the same time, and he wrote this in his book uh, in 1989. Uh, the emperor's new mind. So uh, l- let me come back to that in a second. But I, I, at that point, when I read his book in about 1991, uh, I had spent 20 years uh, obsessed with microtubules that I discussed previously. Yeah. The structure, it, the structures inside neurons that are these protein polymers, tube-like uh, hollow cylinders uh, whose walls were uh, kind of like an ear of corn, but in a particular lattice that follows the Fibonacci geometry. And they would they would self organize and move around and run things inside the cell. And I started off in medical in doing a research project in medical school in 1972, uh, studying cancer cells, mitosis. You know how cells divide, and these mitotic spindles, which are microtubules, and centrioles, which are much like cilia that I mentioned earlier, organize this dance where they pull apart the chromosomes in the in the to form two. So all the chromosomes are jumbled together. They're duplicated, and the microtubules come along and grab exactly one set for each daughter cell, pull them apart, and the cell divides, and you get one set of genes in each cell. And in the early 70s, I was looking at this under a microscope in a, in a hematology oncology lab, and everybody else in the lab was going crazy about genes because it was the dawn of the genetic revolution, engineering, gene sequencing hadn't happened yet, and everybody was realizing the possibilities. And I'm sure all those guys went off into Genentech or wherever and probably made a lot of money. But for some reason, I got obsessed with the microtubules and how they knew where to go and what to do. What was organizing this dance, Mm -hmm. this uh, three- or four-dimensional ballet of grabbing these chromosomes and moving them around? And they were anchored by the centrioles and accomplished by these structures called microtubules. So I started to look at the structure of microtubules, and they had just been it had just been characterized by crystallography uh, by uh, uh, what was your name? I think Amos and Clug, Linda Amos and Aaron Clug in England, and as a uh, as a cylindrical lattice of usually thirteen columns of protofilaments of these individual peanut shaped proteins called tubulin, and the tubulin in, in at least in the A lattice, where if you looked at the surface of the microtubule. So imagine it's like a, a, a corn cob or something, except the, the kernels are peanut shaped, uh, uh, like two kernels together, and they're slightly offset in these columns. So you you could follow these helical pathways around the around the cylinder, and these helical pathways would intersect. There were several different possible helical pathways you could you could follow, and they would intersect on any one according to the Fibonacci sequence. One. Two, three, five, eight, thirteen, twenty-one, and so forth, which is a mathematical um, geometry based on the golden rule and found widely in nature and in biology. And uh, somehow this Fibonacci uh, geometry and microtubules seem to organize things and have some kind of native intelligence, at least in mitosis. 
So I saw that they were lattice-like structures. I was looking, I was learning about computers, Boolean lattices, Boolean matrices, and I said, ah, oh, they kind of look like computers. And uh, also at that time, it was discovered that neurons were quite full of microtubules, and in fact, had an enormous number of microtubules because they were so asymmetrical. And before that time, this was the early 70s, the electron microscope, when people looked inside cells, the, elect- the fixative agent for electron microscopy was dissolving all of the microtubules so that the cell looked like a watery soup, looked like a minestrone soup of a bunch of stuff floating around. And that was the idea. When I was in, in college, in, in biology, they said everything floats around. It's, and I said, oh, that doesn't make sense. But anyway, it turned out later, there's this highly organized lattice structure that organizes everything, but the fixative agent had been dissolving them. So when this guy, Keith Porter at Harvard, switched, I think he switched from uh, osmium tetroxide to glutaraldehyde as a fixative agent, uh, it might have been the other way around, but I think that's right. All of a sudden, he saw all this structure, all these microtubules. And at first, people thought, well, those are artifacts. But it turns out, you no, know, they were real, and their absence was artifact because uh, the previous fix had been dissolving them. So three things. Microtubules seem to have some kind of organizational ability and intelligence. Uh, two, their structure looked like computers. And three, neurons in the brain were full of them. In fact, you could argue that the brain was made of microtubules because yeah. neurons are made of microtubules. It's, it's just like, you know, our bodies, are, everybody call them, they're part of the cytoskeleton, so they the structural support, the bones. The point is they're also the nervous system. They're also the organizational capacity. So now are, the, are, those at the, got, are those at the quantum level? Like when you talk about <clears throat> what, where does it go down to the quantum level? Like are microtubules yeah. uh, at that level or does it have to be even smaller than that to be quantum? <laughs> You have to go small. You have to go one level down. One level down from that. So, okay. Yeah. So that what like happened was quirk? so in quark. Not quite the quarks. Not not quite the quarks. You have to go. So okay, neurons are like microns. Okay, so ten to the uh, ten to the minus six uh, meters, I think. And then uh, when you, you get down to microtubules, can be that long because they run the, the whole length of a neuron. Like in your in that your sciatic nerve axon goes from your spine to your toe. And that's one neuron, and that's the microtubules in there are continuous oh. in axons. But in dendrites, they're different. They're interrupted in mixed polarity, which makes them even more interesting. Okay. Um, but but their so their length can be as long as a neuron, but their width is about 25 nanometers, so a lot smaller. And the individual tubulins, the proteins, are eight nanometers by four nanometers. So they're down at the nanometer scale. And that's getting to the quantum level, but not yet. And especially because you know, what everybody said, for example, the warm, wet, noisy biological milieu, all this water turning around and whatnot, it'd be impossible to have uh, uh, quantum effects at that level. And that's probably true because on the outside of the microtubule and also inside in the hollow core, there's charges uh, sticking out from each tubule and with, with positive and negative charges, which interact with the water. So it's interacting with the water. Now, that may be coherent and, and dancing with the water, which is another story, but it'd be, it'd be hard to say that that's quantum because it's so uh, interactive and so forth, unless it's all coherently vibrating, which may be true. But if, if you then go to a deeper level um, and, and uh, you look inside, so take one protein, uh, you have the charges on the outside sticking out into the water, but inside you have... Uh, areas that are nonpolar, that are not charged, that are more oil-like due to certain aromatic amino acids. So you know that oil and water don't mix, right? You see a, an oil slick on top of uh, a puddle. They, they separate. And the reason, and oil, you know, more like benzene, thick benzene, it's, it's what goes in our gas tanks. You put it in bulk, it's explosive, and everybody wants it, and uh, it drives our cars, et cetera. But if you take the actual molecule benzene uh, by itself, or think that it's a ring of six carbons uh, with uh, three extra electrons among the six carbons. So what happens is the the electron, these extra electrons, kind of float above and below the ring and form an electron cloud because they're quantum particles and they form this nonpolar uh, uh, electron cloud, or it's called pi resonance. Pi is the electron orbital that they occupy, and the th- three pi, three extra pi resonance orbitals coalesce into one cloud. So each benzene by itself 
is quite literally uh, a pi resonance cloud of, of electrons that are not in any one place, but distributed throughout that cloud. So it's, ba it's basically a quantum entity at that level. And these benzene, or are, they're called aromatic rings, and they're at the end of certain amino acids and also certain neurotransmitters like dopamine. Dopamine is a pleasure molecule. Well, it's, it's basically a benzene ring with a couple uh, uh, OHs and then a little tail with a polar thing that sticks out, and that's dopamine. And serotonin, the mood molecule, uh, has uh, an even more comp complex ring which, and a more complex high resonance cloud. And if you consider uh, other neurotransmitters or other psycho, uh, psychoactive compounds like psychedelics, LSD, uh, psilocybin, uh, DMT, all of them are very complex pi resonance clouds. And that means that they have a fairly large region where electrons can roam around. And while well, they're not roaming, they're actually all over the place at any one time, a fairly large quantum system. And when they get into the nervous system, funny things happen. And um, there was an interesting study about psychedelics in the 70s uh, at, at, with uh, Saul Snyder, who, who discovered the opiate receptor later, and, and some other guys. Uh, and they, they looked at the potency of a class of psychoactive drugs. I think they were the phenylethylamines, I forget. But they were a, uh, a, a series that had fairly similar structure with, with slight modifications and they knew the potency of each one. And they were looking for some kind of correlation of potency with something they can measure. And they, they found that the potency of the particular uh, one of these drugs versus the other was uh, uh, correlated very well with their ability to donate electron resonance energy from the molecule to the receptor. So it had something to do with this pi electron resonance being being donated or lent to the receptor when this molecules occupied it. And I think that's what's happening with the psychedelics and also the main, the mainstream uh, or mainstream, the, the normal uh, neurotransmitters like dopamine, which is a pleasure molecule, serotonin and, and others. Um, even acetylcholine, which doesn't have a pi resonance ring, but it has a, a three methyls, which can do pretty much act at the same. So what happens is when they bind to their target, their receptor, they push that receptor more, uh, more into the, qu the quantum realm, makes it, makes it more of a quantum system. But to do that, they have to get inside the protein, away from all the water and the charge, and into this uh, quantum underground, we call it. Uh, because what happens when, when a protein folds, okay, and this, this also applies to membranes and, and nucleic acids, DNA, and so forth. So a protein uh, is made of uh, a bunch of amino acids. And the way they, they form is that it starts with these nonpolar ends, the oil-like ends sticking together. Oil avoids water. And, these, and so imagine these, uh, these little lollipops with a benzene ring or an indole ring on one end. All the, the lollipop ends stick together and the sticks, the polar charts, stick outward into the water. That makes it stable in water but it, and, and uh, protects the internal uh, high resonance cloud. And that's where the quantum stuff happens. So, and so can can I just interrupt for a sec? Yeah. So, is that is that does that explain what happened with the latest uh, or some of the more recent psychedelic studies where they're doing the brain map brain um, mapping? Or I don't know if mapping is the right word, but where people would be on like psilocybin and and they expected the brains to be all lit up, but really is is that happening on the, that quantum underground that and you they, talked about? And, and they, then, Yes, and so they weren't lit up. You're yeah, so about, there's more energy. The, the so your brain so still... You're, you're... Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, that's the work of Robin Carhart-Harris and David Nutt. And Robin Carhart-Harris was presented at the consciousness conferences several times. Okay. And when he, pre he presented that, I think, in 2012, and it was an amazing study. And uh, what they did, as you said, was they had these volunteers, and they gave them intravenous psilocybin so they would act immediately, almost immediately, while they were in an MRI scanner. And so it's like uh, having a mushroom experience in while your brain's being monitored, both with MRI and also EEG. And as you, as you said, they were expecting, and, and then later they verified, the, the people wrote down their experiences and they were basically tripping. They were having a psychedelic experience. 
without a doubt. Which you would think expanding it, a lot of energy in, in, in the brain, right? Well, that's what they thought. They thought that the MRI would show the brain lit up like a pinball machine, which means increased blood flow and uh, increased metabolism. And they expected EEG to, to be very active, maybe show high-frequency gamma and whatnot. But what they, they were stunned to find that the MRI was cold and dark, like nobody was home, like the brain was, wasn't even active. And the EEG was very low frequency and um, almost, almost not there. It was very, very pitiful, actually. And uh, they really lacked a good explanation. They, they later came up with what I thought was kind of a, a silly explanation. <laughs> so I'll just give you my, I'll just give you my explanation. Yeah. What they said it, was, it didn't make any sense to me, so I'm not even going to try to explain it. What I think is that, as I was saying before, you have these different frequencies and, uh, in the brain. Uh, from starting at the fastest terahertz, 10 to the 12, uh, gigahertz, uh, megahertz, kilohertz, and hertz. And EEG is in the hertz. And I think normally, you know, we're having activity across all these frequencies. Like in, a, in an orchestra, you have high frequency, you have the piccolos, and you have stuff in the middle, the, and you get down to the oboes, and you get down to really uh, percussion. So you have all these frequencies interacting in a very resonant and harmonic way. And uh, uh, I think... In, I think what happened in those studies, I think the psychedelic, the psilocybin molecule, went into its target, its receptors, and what that is is another question, but we'll just leave that aside, and increased the quantum state, and basically uh, the subjects were highly conscious. They were having psychedelic experiences, um, but, they, but they were also kind of disengaged from their membranes. They were disengaged from any need for cognitive function. Uh, they didn't need to, uh, you know, to drive a car. Uh, they didn't need to walk. They didn't need to do anything. They were just having a conscious experience, and their membranes were silent. You didn't need the membranes. Everything was happening at the deeper level. Yeah, I think in the microtubules. Yeah, and uh, so they're conscious in their micro. They're having quantum activity in their microtubules uh, at a very in uh, intensely, but their membranes are on vacation and. If you, you know, you wouldn't want somebody like that to drive you home because their membranes are disconnected, but for them internally, they're having an amazing conscious experience. So that was my explanation. The consciousness occurs at a deeper level and, and it's always happening at that level to some extent, but it kind of shifts. It's like the, the orchestra, all of a sudden everything shifts to very high frequency stuff to the point that, um, you know, you may not even hear it. Um, you know, like even dog whistles, you know, it, it gets so high frequency that we can't hear it. In this case, uh, it, it, there's no outward sign, sound, sign of it, but internally, the subject is highly conscious and an expanded consciousness. Because when you're in quantum, in the quantum state, uh, things are non-local and entangled. So your whole, entire brain, even though it appears inactive, but at the membrane level or the metabolic level, is high, in a highly qu quantum coherent state. It's like lasers coming, getting tuned to each other and becoming resonant. And uh, I think that's what happened. Okay. And that... Uh, go, ahead. go ahead. Well, that, that just expands your consciousness. Yeah. And I think it can even take you to even uh, deeper, uh, deeper levels and higher frequencies. So, like the Beatles said, uh, the, the deeper you go, the higher you fly, the higher you fly, the deeper you go. As you go to a higher frequency, you go deeper into consciousness and, and in those cases, deeper into the psychedelic state. So if we're affecting these little... Uh... <clears throat> Microtubules. Microtubules with psychedelics are people somehow, people like this Wim Hof or other people that are experts experts at, uh, you know, different meditation techniques and things like that. Are they somehow affecting these same microtubules at a different level? That's what I was going to ask. If it's the same as, as lucid dreaming and meditation and uh, all these other things, is the same thing possibly happening? Well, put aside lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming is interesting. You can come back to that. But if you just talk about meditation, you know, it's been known for a long time that, that the, uh, the Dalai Lama's best uh, monk meditators who were sent to Davison's lab 10 years ago or so and, and recorded while meditating have a higher uh, baseline EEG frequency. So what you can measure basically easily is EEG. So, you know, most people operate about 40 hertz, 40, 40 they're EEG. I mean, I think that's just the tip of the, literally the tip of the iceberg of activity to keep your level. 
but um, the monk's baseline was 80. Mm. And when they meditated, it went even higher. So they have, you know, permanent uh, changes in neuroplasticity causing them to high, have higher frequency EEG and baseline them even higher when they meditate. But I suspect that that's quite literally the tip of the iceberg. And if you go, if you look inside, which uh, people like Anurban Bandipati have done experimentally, you see these higher frequency activities going going on, and uh, they're probably at that level. And I would, and I'm pretty sure that uh, meditators, the metabolism goes down, and uh, and you know their brains probably look fairly inactive, kind of like the psychedelic. I'm, um, uh, you know, certainly. Uh, uh, Certain trained uh, Hindu practitioners can slow their metabolism way down for a long time and, and barely even have to breathe. So I think metabolism can go uh, way down, but consciousness goes up. They're, even though most people think that they have to be related, they're not necessarily related. And then, and then the, our emotional state, like we know now that, um, you know, being in a state of, uh, let's say, love or bliss or something resonates and, and the frequency is different from our heart and probably other areas as opposed to being in like a state of hate. So does that, are you, does that connect to the microtubules as well? And can you, can we, can we um, consciously or unconsciously affect uh, the workings at that level? Well, you know, there's, there's, there's a good connection between the brain and the heart, uh, heart mass. And uh, a lot of people talk about that. And uh, you know, the, the heart has a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, gangrene and neurons and microtubules. And some people think there's consciousness in the heart, and there seems to be memory in the heart based on you know heart transplant stories. So I think I think uh, I think they're connected. But um, when you talked about you know uh, feelings and emotions and, and love versus mm -hmm. hate or something, and I think actually that's a very important question that, that people have a hard time with. And uh, let me tell you my my take on that because I, I just wrote a chapter about this. Yeah, for sure, because um, it's so intangible. Like, so we need to sort of like lay that out so people can understand it better. Yeah, well, I mean, feelings are consciousness, and you know, you can't. It's it's the hard problem. You can't really uh, put your finger on what it is, but we all know what it is. You know what it's like to feel. I know what it's like to feel. Um, but how that happens is unknown. Um, so let me switch gears a second. I'll come back to that point uh, to evolution because. Everybody says that uh, life evolved and then consciousness, well, not everybody. Most people say, <laughs> life, you know, life originated, um, or, I don't know, a couple billion years ago, and then evolved, and then at some point consciousness emerged as a result of complex information processing. Yeah. You know, maybe fairly recently with tools and language, or maybe, uh, you know, earlier, but at some point in the evolution of life. Now, the, the uh, Vedanta and Eastern philosophy, Buddhist people would say consciousness has been here all along. And consciousness, uh, and even panpsychists would say that consciousness has been here all, all along and is part of the furniture of the universe. It's just there somehow. But how? You know, if you're a panpsychist would say, uh, you know, that it's like some, this is what I think they're saying. They may not agree. <laughs> that consciousness is pa painted on an atom. You know, it's like a quality of an atom or of a molecule or something. And if you put them in the, put it together in the right way, you get us, you know, that I don't think that's right. That, you know, because would, is it painted on at the level of, of molecule of atoms, of quarks, of gluons, what, uh, or empty space time, even what is empty space time? That's another question. Anyway, uh, if you go back, okay, this, this brings us back to, uh, what I was talking about before about Roger Penrose's book. So bear with me here. So I had spent 20 years going around to uh, talking about microtubules as information processing processors, strictly classical, uh, saying that uh, the singularity, uh, the targets of the singularity was much, was much higher because we had to consider processing inside neurons because a paramecium could be so smart. How could a uh, neuron be so stupid? So each neuron had about a billion tubulins switching in about 10 megahertz, uh, which is nine times set, which is 10 to the 16th operations per second per neuron. I remember that's what the singularity people were saying for the entire brain. But um, I was saying, no, that's the capacity for every neuron. So I was going around to AI meetings and neural network meetings and saying, hey, you know, your target is way downstream. You know, you guys are fooling yourselves. 
And they didn't like that. They would say, you know, go away. You bother me. And, you know, we need this money and they're not going to give us money. You keep your, if you don't shut your mouth. So I became somewhat unpopular, but, uh, you know, I, I earned my keep as an anesthesiologist. I don't have to get grants. I never have had to get grants. So I can just follow my nose. And I think that's one of the problems of the system. Yeah. Because you got to please the people giving away the money. So yeah. You got to do what they think is right. And they're usually wrong. Yeah. Which is why we don't really understand the brain after all this. And this whole brain mapping <laughs> idea is stupid and ridiculous. But anyway, I was unpopular then, and um, but uh, one day somebody said to me, uh, he, he laid the hard problem on me. You know, David Chalmers made this famous later, but of um, you know things like memory and attention and behavior are easy, com- relatively easy compared to consciousness, you know, qualia, feelings. That was the hard problem. Anyway, one day some guy said to me, um, "Let's say you're right, wise guy. How would that explain all this microtubule problem? How would that explain consciousness? How would that explain feelings?" love, joy, emotion, consciousness. And I was a little stunned, actually. I realized this guy had nailed me, that I was a reductionist and didn't really have a, an idea about consciousness. Although I thought at that time, and still think I was right about microtubule-based information processing. But fortunately, that same guy suggested I read a book uh, by Roger Penrose called The Emperor's New Mind. And so I did. And uh, Roger wrote in 1989, I think it was probably 91 when I read it, and it was an amazing book. Uh, the Emperor's New Mind, uh, you know, parable of the Hans Christian Andersen story, the, em- the Emperor's New Clothes, about the emperor walking around naked and everybody's too, uh, you know, enamored of him being emperor to tell him. And some, some kid said, hey, he doesn't have any clothes. So the Emperor's New Mind, Roger's title, was meant to imply that the emperor, and probably referring to Marvin Minsky, the scion of AI, uh, was re- really didn't have a clue. It was really naked in terms of explaining how the mind works. And Roger spent the first half of that book arguing through Gödel's theorem very laboriously that understanding, comprehending, was not a computation, that there had to be something from the outside coming in, a non-computable effect, to bring understanding, And uh, based on Gödel's theorem. And I didn't understand this argument at all. It was very philosophical, very dry, and I'm kind of like glazing over. But uh, he took the time to to explain it and and make the strong argument. And then the second half of the book, he, and and by the way, to me, I'll simplify it. To me, understanding is a feeling. You know, you can look some, when you, you look at something and when you understand what it is, you comprehend it, that's a feeling. And, uh, and one, one example is like chess, chess, the game of chess. And uh, James Tagg has been putting some of these online lately where there are certain chess board situations. Even though a, a computer will generally beat a human in chess, there are certain uh, situations that require understanding of the game and not brute, brute force calculations. And in those conditions, uh, the human will win. So understanding, requir- uh, understanding is a human consciousness feature. And it's basically a feeling. I, I feel that that's right, right? Isn't that how we, we know something's right? We just know it. It's a feeling. So that's the way I skip over all that girl stuff and come, you know, that understanding is a feeling. To understand something, we have to have consciousness. What the heck is consciousness? And Roger said it had to be something from outside. Okay, what was it? Well, this gets back to what we were talking about before, about collapse of the wave function and the measurement problem. So remember, we had a couple of possibilities. Number one, consciousness caused collapse of the wave function. Number two, decoherence, that the quantum supervisor ran into something classical. Number three, multiple worlds, that there's no collapse. None of those really work when you think about it. So Roger came up with an idea called objective reduction. And what he said was, he first, he began by asking, what the hell does it mean for something to be in two places at once? This is a question that nobody else has even attempted to answer. And to answer it, he made a monumental leap and connected quantum mechanics to general relativity, something that's been wanting in physics, you know, the unification, the grand unification theory, uh, linking uh, quantum mechanics to general relativity. Everybody's been trying to do that. But he, he did it conceptually, uh, not necessarily fully mathematically, but conceptually. So general relativity is about curvature and space-time geometry. And, you know, Einstein came up with the idea that space-time is curved and that accounted uh, for gravity. Example, because if space time is curved, you're going to follow the trajectory. And he predicted that um, the sun being a, a big, causing a big curvature in space time, 
around it, um, that a star, distant star behind the sun, its light would be bent around the sun and could be visible to us during an eclipse when the sun wasn't there to block it out. So Arthur Eddington in the 20s, I think, went to this mountaintop during an eclipse. He knew that this star would be behind the sun, and, or should be behind the sun, and when the eclipse happened, lo and behold, he could see the star in front of the sun, meaning that the space-time had curved the light, that the light from that star had followed the curvature of space-time so that we could see it despite the fact that it was be- literally behind the sun, that the, 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 curvature, the mass of the sun had induced this curvature and we could see this star. And that proved Einstein's theory, and he got the Nobel Prize, and maybe I didn't do too, I forget. But it was a really monumental achievement that proved general relativity, that space-time is curved. Now, what space-time actually is is another question. Um, but we know it goes down to the Planck scale at 10 minus 33 centimeters, and Roger's probably the world's expert on what that is with his twister theory and quantum geometry and so forth. But whatever it is, it has a curvature to it. So what he said... Bring it, uh, to bring it together with quantum mechanics and quantum superposition, he said, okay, let's say a, uh, well, first of all, uh, four-dimensional space-time is too hard to imagine. So he used simple two-dimensional space-time sheets. So imagine taking three dimensions of space and condensing it to one, just, just for argument's sake, and then putting t- on, on one axis and then time on the other. So you have a little uh, sheet, a little like piece of paper, and you can draw it. You can see it on a slide. And a mass, a particle, well, first of all, a, a mass or particle would be a curvature in one direction, if you will. If that same uh, particle, in a, if it was in a different location, it would be a curvature in another direction. So a particle in two places at once is basically simultaneous curvature of both space-time. And these little space-time sheets that he had in his book, which I still remember vividly, would separate, and if they continued, you could imagine that each curvature would evolve its own universe, and you'd have multiple worlds, and that would happen again and again. Um, but the trick was, he said, that the separ- that these separations, these superpositions, which are actually separations in the very structure of the universe, were unstable, and would, after a time, particular time t, given by the very simple indeterminacy principle e equals h over t, at time t would uh, reduce, undergo reduction at this objective threshold, hence objective reduction, o, or OR as he calls it. So the, the superposition separations would, would only go so, uh, up to a point, up to a point in time, and then collapse to one or the other. And uh, that was the end of the superposition. You didn't need multiple worlds. You didn't need uh, the outside observer. Now, the real kicker was, well, there are two kickers. The first kicker was, when that happens, every time that happens, a moment of consciousness occurs. So he was saying the opposite of Copenhagen. Copenhagen was saying that consciousness causes collapse. He was saying the collapse causes consciousness. The collapse happens spontaneously due to this in- intrinsic feature of curvature of space-time geometry. It can only go so far, and it collapses to one of, it reduces, it undergoes reduction due to this, this objective threshold. And you have objective reduction, OR. A little thing, if you will, I, I, I occurs at that level. And not only, uh, and that, that curvature in particles would not only apply to big things like the sun, but small things. So, uh, you know, sun, big, big object, big curvature, atom or electron, small particle, small curvature, but still curvature. And, a, and a, even an electron in superposition would be a separation or a shredding or a blistering in the very structure of the universe, and which would tend to want to branch off and form a new universe, but the instability is unstable, and after a, a time T, bing, um, there's a, a collapse and a moment of conscious awareness. So these would be occurring everywhere in the universe, here, there, and everywhere, um, which means that consciousness was kind of, at, at this level, or, or what we prefer to call proto-consciousness, because these are random moments uh, uh, disjointed that, and not entangled, so they're, they're uh, isolated and random. You know, little, little random moments of awareness here, there, and everywhere, but then there's no memory, they're forgotten. 
And it's kind of like panpsychism where consciousness is everywhere. But in this case, consciousness is not occurring due to being painted on a, an atom or it's occurring due to a collapse. So if an atom is in superposition of, of two states and then collapses to one, that's when the moment of consciousness occurs. And it also suggests that consciousness is not a property or a state, but it's a sequence of events, the sequence of collapse, 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 similar to the, uh, the ideas of Alfred North Whitehead, who said, uh, the process philosopher, who said consciousness is a, uh, a sequence of events uh, or occasions of experience, very similar to Whitehead. In fact, it was Abner Shimini who likened uh, um, Whitehead's occasion of experience to quantum state collapses. And Rogers quantum state collapses, his objective reduction is due to this uh, instability in space-time geometry uh, is a perfect explanation for that happening, connecting whitehead, quantum physics, and consciousness. So that means that these random uh, moments are happening here, there, and everywhere. So Andy suggested there must be something in the brain. So in his book, he talked about this, and I remember looking at these pictures, I'm going, oh my God, this guy's like out there. But that is so cool. And uh, it was kind of blown away. I, I thought about it for weeks and realized how, how uh, to everybody, and even to me, it seemed like a stretch. You know, you're going to explain the brain and consciousness. You're going to go to space-time geometry and the Planck scale and what the hell. Um, but as he later said, um, quoting Sherlock Holmes, if you eliminate the impossible, whatever is left must be true no matter how seemingly improbable. So he pretty much ruled out everything else. You have to get out of the computational system. And if, there, if you think of the universe as materialistic and a billiard ball, in a billiard ball universe, the only way, way to go, where you have no other place to go, is quantum mechanics, where you find a big mystery. So he essentially decided, I don't know if he uh, just deduced, that the mystery of consciousness and the mystery of quantum mechanics must, might be related. It might be the same, same mystery. Now, we've been... Uh, accused of, of, of that being a vice, not a virtue, that invoking we, when Roger and I hooked up in our theory, which I'll come to you in a bit, of uh, Dave Chalmers uh, kidded us for invoking the law of minimization of mysteries. But I think, you know, it could be true, and it links general, general relativity to structure of the universe, quantum mechanics, and, and the brain, and consciousness. But he didn't, have a, he didn't have a way to organize this in the brain. He needed a quantum computer in the brain. And uh, I read this book, and after you know, crocking it and, and figuring out how profound it was, I said, "Holy crap! Uh, microtubules are the quantum computer he's looking for." And this subjective reduction was a mechanism that I've been looking for uh, for consciousness. Uh, in other words, the objective reduction couldn't happen at the level of neurons; they're too big. Uh, but you needed something smaller that could be a quantum and could yet could influence. They're on to control behavior and make your arm move and your and your voice speak. Something that could control behavior and and, be, and have consciousness. And microtubules were had to be quantum computers in some way. And I already been thinking along those lines to some extent, um, but didn't really know enough about quantum mechanics. Anyway, I wrote to Roger and I sent him some papers I'd written about microtubules. Told him about them. And said, by the way, I was going to be in England for a uh, conference, and I, if you want, I'd be happy to visit him. I was delighted when he wrote back and invited me to his uh, mathematical institute in Oxford, where we sat for about four hours, where I did almost all the talking, yes, and <laughs> questions, and I told him everything about microtubules. And he mentioned that he was going to a conference on uh, on consciousness with uh, at Cambridge with Dan Dennett and Pat Churchland and some other bigwigs philosophers. Who were sure to give him a hard time about uh, about it about his ideas because they they hated the idea of quantum mechanics. They want the brain to be classical computer. Period. End of story. No mystery. Uh, which I don't think it, it could be, but you know that's really the mainstream view. Anyway, uh, he Roger thanked me and uh, we said goodbye and I went on my way and uh, I said, well, that was interesting. Um, I couldn't go to the conference in Cambridge. I had another conference to go to. A couple of weeks later, I was uh, fly, uh, going back through London, uh, having the night before flying back, and a friend of mine, having dinner with a friend, he said, hey, this guy I know went to Cambridge and to this conference, and Roger Penrose was talking about you and your microtubules. <laughs> and I was just, like, blown away and thrilled. And uh, the next thing I know, I was invited to this conference in northern Sweden um, with Roger and uh, uh, Dan Dennett and a few other people. And, uh, you know, I got to know Roger 
a little bit more. His wife Vanessa was there. They just recently been married, and we spent a lot of time together playing ping pong, which was popular in the basement of this. Uh, it was a, a weird conference, just like speakers only and uh, no audience. And uh, we had a lot of time to uh, to talk and uh, uh, went on walks in the midnight sun, and we actually went skiing uh, at midnight uh, up there. It was way, way north of the Earth Circle, the Polar Circle, the Kong. And uh, I invited him at that. I, I was organizing the first Tucson conference, science of consciousness, toward a science of consciousness that was then. And I invited him and he accepted. And uh, I kind of bribed him. I said, I'll take you to the Grand Canyon afterwards, which I did. And uh, he and his wife. And, uh, we, you know, we, we began a friendship and a, and a, rela- and a collaborative relationship. And uh, we then met again uh, a few months later and started to, you know, quantify our, uh, our ideas come up with a formal model of uh, objective reduction in microtubules. And uh, Roger said uh, one night, he said, well, what should we call it? And this, you know, because it's different. And uh, I said, I don't know, let me think about it. So I went for a long bike ride. And uh, on this bike ride, the idea of orchestration came to me. I was uh, actually coasting down the hill. It was quite pleasurable. And uh, orchestrated objective reduction. And uh, I, I had a kind of musical analogy, analogy in mind. It was because the, the microtubules orchestrated things inside the cell. And I bounced it off Roger at breakfast the next morning. We were staying in the uh, same house, a big family house that uh, we rented rooms out of uh, for a couple-week period around a conference. And uh, in, 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 at the Danish Technical University where he had friends and I had, uh, I had spent a sabbatical. And he said, oh, I like that. And so that's what we call it, orchestrated objective reduction. And we started to quantify it. We figured out that for a 40 hertz moment with in the equation, if you set T equal to 40 hertz, that you get about 100,000 neurons worth of microtubules, which uh, which seemed to work with other theories. So we were off to a good start. But that's what his wife said to me. He said, uh, she said, uh, you know, I encourage you to work with Roger, but I just want want to warn you, he's very meticulous. He's way overburdened. This is going to take a long, long, long time. <laughs> And I said, <laughs> I, said I, was, I said, okay, I'm willing to, you know, I'm willing to stick with it. So um, that was in uh, June, and by the following Christmas or so, um, New Year's, uh, we didn't we didn't even have a manuscript. It, we were going back and forth by fax. It was very slow going. And uh, you know, I was in Tucson, he was in England. Anyway, I think in January of '95, I got an email. I, I guess I'd email them uh, from the the uh, publisher, a friend of mine, of the Journal of Consciousness Studies, East uh, Sutherland. And uh, he wrote to Roger, too, and he said, uh, Pat Churchland and her, her graduate student, Pat Churchland is a materialist philosopher at UC San Diego, and a harsh critic, one of our harshest critics, and uh, um, which is okay. Uh, I kind of like jousting with her and others. Um, anyway... He and a graduate, even, we hadn't published anything, but Roger had been talking about it, and I had been talking about it online in a discussion group and at conferences and whatnot, about quantum microtubules and consciousness and so forth. And uh, Roger, and Roger was also famous for tiling the plane with, with five-fold symmetry. So Penrose tilings were, uh, were, were one of his uh, hallmarks of fame. So they wrote this harshly critical, sarcastic, kind of obnoxious paper in the Journal of Consciousness Studies called Gaps in Penrose's Toiling, hmm. uh, a pun on, on tilings. Uh, because he tiled the plane com- completely, and a gap would be a, a, you know, a defect, so it wouldn't be tiling, but it was toiling. So it was kind of a clever clever title, Gaps in Penrose's Toilings. And uh, at the end, uh, then he talked about microtubules, and they said, uh, uh, Penrose and Hameroff's uh, Theory, it wasn't really a theory then, but it was moving towards there. This theory is no better supported than one in a gazillion caterpillar with hookah hypotheses. Huh. Whoa. <laughs> one in a gazillion caterpillar with hookah hypotheses. As in, what have you guys been smoking or something like that? And uh, I, was, uh, I was amused, but also kind of pissed off. Uh, but what they did in the article was the first half of their article was attacking Roger on the Girdle's theorem argument. The second half of the article, which she had assigned apparently to her grad student, Rick Rush, who's now a really pr- prominent philosopher, uh, was about microtubules. So it was, Gr- and Grush had been on a, on a uh, we were on an e- email discussion group, uh, 
called Psyche D. This was the first one I was aware of, and it was quite intense for a few years. It faded away after a while. Now there's a zillion of them, of course, but this was the first one I was aware of. And he was on it, and I was on it, and I had been blabbing about microtubules and so forth. So he took me on the second part of the, about attacking the idea of microtubules as quantum devices, and as, and most specifically, as being relevant to consciousness. So his big, uh, you know, his big, uh, his big body blow that he was going to knock me out with was the following. Uh, there's a drug called colchicine, which is used for gout. Gout is, uh, you know, your, your, the, the joint by your big toe or some other part of your body swells up uh, because of uric acid crystals, uric crystals. And what happens is the immune cells, the lymphocytes and the macrophages, rush in to engulf the uh, uric crystals and release a lot of stuff and cause inflammation in the joint swells and hurts like hell. It's called gout. And it comes from eating rich food, and supposedly a lot of the kings had it and whatnot. You see a picture of this guy with his foot up on a pillow with his toe swelling. And anyway, there's a drug called colchicine, which uh, attacks the microtubules and prevents them. So anyway, the, the, let me back up. The, the lymphocytes and the macrophage move into the joint because their microtubules assemble and disassemble and assemble and disassemble. The thing literally flows where they're supposed to go. Now, how they know where to go is another question. That, pro- that also involves the microtubules. But just their motor ability, their ability to get where they want to go, move along is by microtubules assembling and disassembling. Mm. So, and then colchicine uh, binds to microtubules or tubulin and prevents this assembly disassembly. So if you have gout and you take colchicine, it helps a lot because it prevents the lymphocytes the white cells from moving into the joint. In other words, it's not the uric crystals that cause the pain. It's the, it's the lymphocytes and the macrophages, the immune cells that, that, sw- that move in by virtue of their microtubal activity to engulf the uric and, and release all the stuff, and that swells, and that's what hurts like hell. So if you paralyze the lymphocytes with this colchicine, no gout or no pain. So Rick Rush tells a story, and then he says, but... People who take colchicine for gout don't lose consciousness. Therefore, microtubules cannot be essential for consciousness. <laughs> and he really thought he had us. And uh, anyway, uh, so I read this article, and, uh, and Roger read it, and uh, the editor says, says, you guys can respond if you put a paper together. Uh, it, it, you can respond to the very next issue if you give me a manuscript in two weeks. And I'm going to myself two weeks, it's been eight months and we don't have anything. Yeah. Yeah, we're screwed. And, uh, but fortunately, Roger was sufficiently annoyed uh, <laughs> because of the girl's argument thing. And he said, well, let, let's do it this way. He said, let's, uh, I'll, I'll deal with Girdle. You, you deal with the microtubules. And uh, um, I said, absolutely. So by dividing the, uh, dividing the labor that way, he said, uh, he, he worked on his own on the Girdle's theorem. Uh, I worked on the microtubules. We wrote an abstract together, and we put out our paper. That was, co- and I'll tell you what I said about the colchicine in a minute. But the the uh, the title of the uh, of the paper the, theirs was gaps in Penrose and Toilings. Ours was what gaps. Um, and what we said was um, uh, so. What I said about the colchicine. So he he took care of the girls' argument. I took care of all the microtubule arguments. And the uh, the uh, the colchicine story was simple because, uh, first of all, it only affects microtubules that are actively assembling and disassembling. And the microtubules in the brain don't do that. Neurons don't divide. This is a key, a key point. The neurons in the, uh, in, the, in the brain don't divide. Therefore, they're microtubules. So in all other cells, when it's time to divide, the microtubules that are arrayed all over the place disassemble, form tubulins, then reassemble as mitotic spindles so the cell can divide, form daughter cells, and the microtubules go back to doing what they were doing. So if you were going to store memory, for example, in the microtubules, you couldn't do that in those kinds of cells because every time they disassembled, you'd lose the memory. In neurons, the microtubules stay assembled, and, and you, they would store memory that's, that's, that's stored in uh, microtubule lattices. We actually have a good idea now how that happens to this enzyme called CAMK2. But, but to be that as it may, the colchicine doesn't affect microtubules that don't disassemble and reassemble, number one. Number two, colchicine doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. It's too charged. So it's not going to get into the brain at all. Number three, 
I found a paper from somebody in France who had, in, for some reason, injected colchicine into the uh, CSS, into the ventricles of mice, and they wiped them out. They were like, uh, they pretty much destroyed their brain because the colchicine did screw up the microtubules there. So I pretty much dispensed with that argument and the other ones, which were, which were sillier. And uh, in the end, to, to um, counter their, their statement of uh, uh, no better, the Alice in Wonderland story. So the idea that uh, uh, our idea was no better than one in a gazillion caterpillar with hookah hypothesis came from Alice, Alice in Wonderland, uh, where the, uh, I, was it, the caterpillar was sitting on a mushroom smoking a hookah, and Alice, uh, well, I forget what she was doing. But um, so that's what they were saying. So what we said, but it was Alice in Wonderland. So what we said was, perhaps we're not in Wonderland. Perhaps their heads are in the sand, <laughs> suggesting that they were ostriches with their heads buried in the sand, which is basically true, actually. So the the editor of the journal, who is a pretty interesting character, uh, got this artist to do a um, to do a cartoon. It turns out this guy was actually a uh, kind of a uh, erotic artist. I found out later, and uh, but pretty clever guy. So he uh, he wrote, he did this cartoon where this caterpillar whose head and face looked just like me for some reason, sitting on this uh, 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 giant mushroom smoking a hookah, and uh, on the other side is Roger holding the keys to the uh, dressed as a white rabbit holding the keys to the platonic realm. Um, and the platonic realm is something that we haven't gotten to yet. And in between us are two. Uh, kind of scrawny ostriches with with their heads buried in their sand, <laughs> in the sand with their butts facing the viewer, with G- Grush and Churchland written on their butts, or G and C, I guess it was. And I, they had me, the caterpillars, blowing the hookah smoke up their butts. <laughs> so that's kind of how they captured the moment. And uh, they 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 sent it to us. Actually, Roger and I were at a meeting at the Fetzer Institute when they they said, "Hey, we had to, we want to." So we wrote the article, we sent it, and they said, okay, we're going to publish it. And just when they're about to go to press, we get this fax or uh, phone call or whatever from uh, the journal. I said, hey, we, we had this artist do this sketch. Do you mind? And I looked at it, and I said, oh, my God, I can't believe this. But I said, what the hell? But I didn't know if Roger would go for it. And uh, he was there with me, and he said, yeah, why not? So they published this, and it's out there, and I still have a copy. Uh, but the point was that that was our first paper in 1995 and it was fortuitous because without them attacking us, it probably would have been another year. Yeah. But in in 96, we came out with two papers, one a book chapter, where we laid out all the details uh, in agonizing uh, detail, I might say, and then wrote another paper for journal of conscious studies for the hard problem. And then Dave Chalmers had made famous his hard problem. And um, um, we wrote a paper basically saying that, uh, the hard problem was solved by these self collapses occurring due to separation in space time geometry. And that was our solution to the hard problem. And uh, we then wrote, uh, we didn't collaborate again. Uh, I wrote a number of papers about it until the uh, last few years. But um, anyway, that was our first paper. And, uh, um, you know, then the subsequent papers. And our ideas were, were, uh, greeted with a lot of critical skepticism, if not derision. Um, we really pissed people off uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, first of all, the AI people didn't like it because it was saying that not only did we have to go to even greater computation, we had to go to quantum to um, you know, capture the essence of the brain. So they didn't like that for several reasons. It pissed off the physicists because they didn't like Roger's approach to the, quant- uh, the measurement problem. They preferred multiple worlds or decoherence or something else. Because who the hell wanted to mess with consciousness? You know, why were they? Why were we? I'm paraphrasing their thoughts. Why were we bringing consciousness and messing up a perfectly nice materialistic uh, universe, even though uh, it didn't make any sense? And uh, neuroscientists didn't like it because uh, they thought, you know, you can explain everything at the neural membrane and synapse level. And uh, hardly anyone did like it, actually. Um, <laughs> Uh, except, uh, actually people started to like it, you know, people who liked it were more in the, uh, kind of the spiritual, uh, new age, uh, kind of thing, which, uh, Roger didn't really take to, but I, you know, I, I kind of, uh, agree with a lot of that stuff, but I, but I think it has to be based on science, you know, woo woo, like you say, but, 
But what they're describing is subjective experience. Uh, they just need a scientific basis for it. So um, anyway, uh, uh, people mostly ridiculed it on the basis of the decoherence argument because in our, in our early papers, we were saying, okay, so the brain is clocking at 40 hertz, 40, 40 times a second, which is 25, uh, 25 milliseconds. So we were thinking we had to avoid decoherence. We had to maintain a quantum state in microtubules, not just in one, one microtubule, but in microtubules that are entangled across a significant region of the brain for 25 milliseconds. And that's a, that's a long time at the quantum level. And, uh, and it was kind of, and, you know, so we got ripped for that because everybody said, well, I mean, people, quantum computer technology, to build a quantum computer in a laboratory, you have to worry about thermal vibrations and heat. You have to worry about atoms bumping into it and messing up the quantum superposition. Uh, and so they do it at absolute zero temperature. So all the quantum stuff was done at absolute zero temperature in the lab with liquid nitrogen and all this. And they go, ha, 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 37 degrees centigrade in the brain, the warm, wet, noisy brain, you must be joking. It's not, it's impossible. And we said, well, you know, uh, uh, how do you know? Uh, biology has had billions of years to evolve a mechanism, number one. Number two, I said it's happening not out in the water, but it's happening in the quantum under, quantum underground in these nonpolar oil-like regions inside proteins. <laughs> not only inside proteins, inside membranes and also nucleic acids. They all have this nonpolar quantum interior, what we now call a, the quantum underground. We being uh, Jack Jasinski, Travis Craddock, and I who collaborated in parallel with with my collaboration with Roger over the years, and also Anurban Bandyapati, who's done the actual experiments. I'll come to him in a second. Uh, I was saying it's, it's happening in the quantum underground, not on the water. And anyway, how do you know? Uh, so it was, but it was basically theory versus theory. And, uh, you know, we were definitely outvoted. So uh, we are thought to be kind of an oddball uh, idea, and still are by, by most people, or many people. However, in uh, 2006, it began to be realized that uh, something as universal in life as photosynthesis, by which plants capture photons and convert them to um, energy, food energy, chemical energy that we eat or animals eat, we eat the animals, and without which uh, life could not exist, that what happens in photosynthesis is that um, there's this, this protein complex with three components. One collects the photons. The second one transfers the energy to the third part, which converts it to chemical energy in food. And it turns out that the middle part, which is called the FMO protein, can, uh, somehow the photons are converted to excited electrons, excitons, which are quantum particles, and propagate through this protein in multiple paths simultaneously. In other words, it's not just like a current flowing from one point to another. It's that these excitons uh, spread out. They're either the same exciton in superposition or multiple excitons. I still am not sure. But I think it's probably, you can think of them as the same in multiple pathways and, uh, and get to the, other, get to the uh, end of it and then get converted to food. And if this propagation, if this transfer is not very efficient, you don't make food, animals don't survive, we don't survive. This needs to be very efficient. And it turns out that what happens is the exodons either hop or propagate or through what are called chromophores, which are essentially the pi resonance groups I was talking about before, kind of like complex benzene, little uh, regions of them. And they transmit, propagate, mediate the quantum superposition, the quantum transfer from the photon being collected to making food. <laughs> so this, this quantum superposition, this quantum traveling salesman problem where the guy goes through all possible pathways at the same time is the most efficient way. And without that, there wouldn't be this efficient transfer of food. And not only that, it was happening in sunlight. It was happening at warm temperature, at ambient temperature. So if a plant can do it, if a rutabaga or a potato can figure out how to utilize quantum coherence at warm temperature, Certainly, our brains, after billions of years of evolution, or however many years, to do so. So yeah. that was that was good for us. However, people said, "Well, blah blah blah. Uh, you have to show it in microtubules." And then some other evidence for quantum biology came out in bird bird brain navigation and a few other things. Uh, and then uh, in 2009, I met this guy Anurban Bandyapati, uh, an Indian uh, 
a scientist working in Japan at the National Institute of Material Science. Uh, he, I was going to a conference in Hong Kong. He emailed me and said, hey, I've got evidence for your theory. I want to I want to meet you in Hong Kong. Wow. Said, Absolutely fantastic. So I remember uh, uh, we sat down. He, he pulls out his laptop and starts showing me slide after slide after slide after slide of stuff. It was, it was hard to keep up with. And uh, basically what he had done is uh, experiments where he took individual microtubules. He's a nanotechnologist, he, who, uh, so he does nanotechnology and biology. And, uh, and by the way, he got his lab in, in Japan, at the National Institute of Material Sciences, which is one of the outstanding places in the world in materials, have a contest every year for the smartest graduate student, not even a postdoc, graduate student mm. around the world, and they give them their own lab. They said, forget it, just come here and work, do what you want. And they have a worldwide contest, and he won it. Wow. And right out of grad school, he went there, and they gave him this, whatever he wanted, and he started doing this. Net, well, the first thing he did was build a, um, an, a molecular computer with a molecule called uh, hydroquinones that was published in, I forgot, before I met him, and I forget where. But then he got interested in microtubules. He read our papers and he started working on microtubules and he learned all this biology. So he would take an individual microtubule at room temperature and put four nanoprobes, scanning tunneling microscope probes or atomic force microscopes on one microtubule and use them as kind of electrodes to stimulate and record. The basic, so he has a microtubule, which is a, a good insulator, basically, uh, unless you, you find this resonant frequency. And there's this microtubule at, at, at ambient temperature. It's not frozen. It's at ambient temperature. Uh, and he puts two electrons, two electrodes, nanoprobes to stimulate and two to record. And if you just uh, do measure its resistance, it's, it's a perfect insulator. But if you then stimulate with alternating current, the other two electrodes get it vibrating. And then measure the, the, uh, the, current, the, the resistance you find that at certain critical frequencies, the resistance drops, it plummets. It becomes almost superconductive, um, except that there's a resistance between the electrode and the surface of the microtubule, and it's probably being uh, transmitted through the, the quantum underground. But at certain, resonant fre at certain frequencies, the microtubule becomes highly conductive. And these are, he, he plotted, mapped these, these frequencies, and as I said, uh, they're in the terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, gigahertz, and then hertz. And at each frequency band, he got a triplet a triplet pattern. In other words, if he, if he plotted out the, uh, the resistance, he got a triplet. And then if you looked inside that triplet, in each of those three peaks, you got another three peaks. And maybe even more if you went down. So it's like a, fra uh, a fractal at each frequency. And you can think of the whole thing as a frequency fractal. That's what he calls it. <laughs> and he found these resonances in these microtubules at all these frequencies. So, and he eventually published in, in 2013. So that was very good evidence for our theory, although when he finally published, he didn't use the word quantum because he said basically the, the, edit, the reviewers wouldn't let him. Um, but um, it almost has to be a quantum effect. But more to the point, he said in the paper that if you, um, if you measure the resistance across one tubule, over, in other words, over one little protein, and uh, at any particular frequency, and compare that to the resistance over an entire microtubule, what you found, now normally you'd expect the resistance, the, the current flow through a one, one tubule and one protein, uh, the, the resistance to be lower, the current to be higher, than if you did it uh, through a whole microtubule because the resistance would add up, so the current should be lower. What he found was that the current through an entire microtubule is much, much higher than through an individual tubule. Uh, which, almost, which essentially has to be a quantum effect. And yeah. Roger agreed with that. And also that it was temperature independent. That no matter what temperature, you still got the same effect. And that has to be a quantum effect. So that's in the paper, but he couldn't come out and say it's a quantum effect because yeah. the reviewers wouldn't let him. So the evidence is there. Now, since then, he's done, he's done a number of other studies where he actually uh, did this inside active neurons and in bundles of in bundles of uh, microtubules, and it found has found this frequency fractal from terahertz all the way up to gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz, and hertz. Um, his papers are very difficult to read, and uh, but nonetheless, the the data is there. So, in other words, we've had pretty good supportive evidence. Of course, 
Uh, that doesn't change people's minds. Uh, evidence doesn't really matter when you have got a strong, you know, belief and and you're you're highly invested in selling your idea. So, nonetheless, I I um, I maintain that the evidence for our theory is far greater than for any other theory of, of consciousness. Nobody has come up with a testable theory, even idea, a testable uh, uh, prediction of how you can prove consciousness is a network effect or, or an emergent effect or a neuronal effect. Uh, because all those neurons have microtubules, so even if you proved it, it wouldn't show. It, it would now. That's a bit of an unfair statement. Um, but what we intend to do is, uh, and we hope to do this at the Penrose Institute, which was announced today, um, with Honor Bond's help, is to reproduce his quantum resonances and microtubules inside neurons. Get this spectral plot of of the frequency, fractal frequency, and then do the entire thing again in the presence of anesthesia and see if this resonance goes away. And then, if it does, see if it comes back when you turn off the anesthesia. And if you do it in the gas phase, you can just do it continuously. And then we do it with a different anesthetic that's twice as potent and see if you only need half as much. And you do that for all these different anesthetics. This, is, this goes back to what's called the meyer overton correlation, that anesthetic potency is proportional to their solubility, essentially in benzene, in, in olive oil in these pi resonance. So the solubility in these pi resonance group of anesthetics is directly proportional to their potency. The more potent it is going in the quantum underground, the more potent it is in inhibiting consciousness. So we would do that. We hope to do that experiment. And then we'll try psychedelics. We'll give it some dopamine or we'll give it some LSD or we'll give it some psilocybin and see oh, what happens to the quantum resonances. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is in a test tube, fellas. So I'll now. go in a but test tube. <laughs> What we would do would 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 then uh, add it and then measure. And what I would predict would be that the frequencies would go higher, and and the the slower frequencies, like in uh, Robin Carhart Harris's subjects, that the slower frequencies would would slow down, and there'd be a big shift towards the higher frequency. And it could be that at least the, you know in in the brain that under certain circumstances that you could shift to even higher frequencies that are too high to be stuck to the biology would be happening in the structure of space-time geometry and possibly non-local. And, After you die. Uh, yes, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, and so forth. And, uh, and even after death. And by the way, there's some very interesting work about um, people who... Uh, this guy uh, uh, at George Washington University um, I think it was name in a second. Um, it's done work putting uh, a brain monitors, uh, uh, Chala, uh, Lachmir Chala, C H A W L A, who is a palliative care specialist who takes care of pe- people who are dying, and if they withdraw support with family and uh, approval and whatnot, he's putting these brain monitors on these patients, same ones we use in anesthesia, and at the time of death, there's this. Uh, the, this EEG number this uh, goes to zero. It's kind of a compiled number. But basically, 80 to 100 is awake. 40 to 60 is where you put on your patient on it under anesthesia, so they're not awake. Below that is some kind of brain damage. Uh, so as the patients approach death, their number, and the heart rate slows, and the blood pressure slows, and then they get to absolute. They they get uh, towards zero, and the heart has stopped, and then. In about half the cases, there's a burst of activity in the high gamma frequency, and uh, it's it's the, it's the sign under any other, under any other circumstance of being highly conscious and highly awake. Uh, and some people explain it away by saying, uh, "Well, it's just random spasms of dying neurons," but that makes no sense at all because gamma has to be highly coherent over a wide part of the brain, hmm. so it's completely unexplained. And I wonder why it's half only. Cold. What's that? I wonder why half only. Yeah, well, that's a good question, and uh, um, could be a lot of reasons. Maybe they've already it's already happened. Maybe they're brain dead and it's already happened. Maybe it doesn't happen in everybody. Maybe some people are zombies. I, I don't know. Uh, ICU nurses started doing this around the country, and it got to, you know, as patients were dying, but they stopped doing it because if, if, a, if, a, if the, the family would start to, like, you know, look at this as a sign of, you know, their loved one going on to heaven, and if it didn't happen, they were really upset. Oh, so right. they stopped doing it. Yeah. So why it doesn't happen, I don't know. I mean, the question is why it happens at all when it does happen. But huh. it, it could be that we don't really know. And uh, uh, 
but it also happens in animals. Somebody uh, uh, came up a region from the University of Michigan uh, had a, a paper at the last Tucson conference on doing this in, in rats. And uh, the same thing happened. They get this burst of, that, of, of high gamma. So does that mean rats have souls? Well, why wouldn't they? I mean, I don't know. Uh, if this is the soul, if this is the soul leaving the body. I, I can't say that that's what it is, but it certainly could be the neural correlate of the near-death experience, except that these people do die. But it, it does, you know, this whole thing about uh, uh, near-death and out-of-body experiences um, uh, is, is interesting. And uh, about, uh, oh gosh, about 15, 16 years ago, uh, the study, the, uh, the first studies came out of, uh, from Ping Ban Lamo in the Netherlands and uh, Peter Fenwick in England. And, uh, you know, they studied, each of them in separate studies, studied a couple hundred patients who had cardiac arrest. And they both found about 17% of them reported near death or out of body experiences. And uh, they're all very similar. Uh, they had the, uh, the white light, the, the tunnel, the visiting dead relatives sense of calm, the complete lack of panic. Uh, and uh, when they came back, it kind of changed them for the good, generally speaking. So, um, uh, and the, the BBC did a show about this. And on one patient in particular, a very famous case, uh, and uh, she, uh, she came back, uh, I won't mention her name because she's passed on since, but she lived about 10 years after, uh, after the event. It was a very famous case, and uh, she remembered everything that was going on. And first, uh, they thought it was lightness under anesthesia, but it couldn't have been because it happened while she was on hypothermic arrest and so forth. So um, it seemed a, pre a pretty bona fide case of, uh, of near-death and out-of-body experience. And uh, the BBC did a show about near-death and out-of-body, and, and particularly about her. And the show, <clears throat> excuse me, the show was called The Day I Died. And... Uh, Ben Alexander's written, <laughs> excuse me, has written a lot about this. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the, B the BBC um, did a show, and uh, they asked uh, they asked Peter Fenwick and Tim Malama, "Well, how do you explain this?" And they said, "We have no idea. Why don't you ask Penrose and Hammeroff? Because they have that crazy idea." <laughs> excuse me a second. I have to have a drink. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway. Um, so uh, BBC uh, contacted me, and they said, Roger didn't really want to contact, really want to comment. And I said, well, you know, I've seen uh, uh, near-death, I, I know about this from medicine. And so I don't know for sure, but what could be happening is that high frequencies, the, uh, the blood stops flowing, <coughs> sorry, not at high frequencies, at, at, the, at the time of death, the blood stops flowing, and the oxygen is, is gone, and the microtubal quantum oscillations um, don't just terminate, but they dissipate the space-time geometry around them because they're happening in space-time geometry, even in the microtubules. And but they remain entangled as something that might be called a quantum soul and can live. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I wouldn't say live, but exist uh, at least temporarily out of the body. Uh, I need a drink. Hang on, please. Yeah, I sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Darren, it's interesting. I wanted to ask him as well about uh, Alzheimer's because I think the microtubules are <clears throat> somehow involved in memory and disconnection in uh, Alzheimer's. I think so? Yeah. That's your theory? No, I think that's what these guys say. Oh. Yeah, and then our our guests have some questions. Uh, not our guests. Um, okay, sorry. Right. Yeah. I'm back. So, yeah, so you were talking about, the, talking about the, uh, the soul, um, the the uh, entangled quantum soul, really, right? Well, what we're saying is that under normal circumstances, consciousness is happening in your brain and my brain at the level of the quantum underground and microtubules, which is really uh, curvatures and deformation of uh, the space-time geometry, which comprises the universe everywhere. But it gets um, it's organized and, or and, and uh, undergoes these quantum collapses and uh, in a certain way, in an orchestrated way, in the brain, uh, but then when the brain uh, is dying, the, the, these quantum oscillations, which occur in space, that they shift to a higher frequency, even higher than, than uh, what, what the brain can handle. They may do that anyway at various times, mm -hmm. and just uh, uh, can exist in space-time geometry without the biology, in a sort of non-local, distributed kind of way. Oh, I but, see. Now I'm starting to get it. 
but rather than dissipate and just kind of, uh, you know, uh, like the second law of thermodynamics, they stay entangled as one entity. Yeah. And uh, what you might call a quantum soul. Uh, that Roger doesn't like that term, and, and uh, so I, you know, I don't attribute it to him, but it's an idea that I've thought about. And I actually wrote a paper with Deepak Chopra about it, about because he knows a lot about near death, not about experiences, where we propose that that these are actually uh, entangled uh, uh, activities in fundamental space time geometry that remain uh, remain entangled and could exist indefinitely, or could go into another bunch of microtubules somewhere in reincarnation. And I think there's actually some pretty decent evidence for from pediatrics for for reincarnation. Uh, of memories from from just from uh, past life or just other people's. Yeah. So. Well, there's a lot of a lot yeah, of past life healing as well that happens. I mean, I know people that do past life healing, and they've been just healed by acknowledging past lives. I mean, it's there's a lot of evidence for all this stuff, NDEs and OBEs and and reincarnation. Right. Yet they just don't want to look at it. They they put it in this bucket uh, over to the side for you know just to ignore. That's true, and one of the main reasons is that is because they get they get ridiculed for being non scientific because the not the scientists, the materialist scientists, just say, well, that's that's absurd, that's impossible. You just, you know, this is this is pseudoscience, this is bullshit. That's what they say. But those same people who say that can't explain consciousness in the brain. So how can they say it can't occur out of the brain? You know, it's totally hypocritical. When they explain consciousness in the brain, then they can say, you know, it can't happen out of the brain. But until they do. Uh, I think it's a viable possibility. Now, I don't like to talk about it too much because, you know, it, it's, it takes away from, from my uh, work in terms of, you know, how anesthesia works and what consciousness actually is in the brain. Um, but I do think, and I differ slightly with Roger about this, although he said the other day, I was with him in London, and he said the other day that he believed that the consciousness could go to another body uh, in some sense. So that could be. Um, but you know, to get there, we have to be in between somehow. So, so, so uh, but how how does your theory explain the connecting to, for lack of a better term, like the akashic records, or 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 just the the ether? I mean, is are the microtubules also as some sort of receiver? Like, it, 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 consciousness isn't just the, at the quantum underground of the brain, right? It, it, do you think that it's also uh, is it just moving around in superposition so that it can be accessed by the? Well, I think uh, I, I think as I said as I said before, well, I think there is something like the akashic record, and I think their their consciousness is everywhere because it's like you know decoherence. It, it replaces decoherence. This collapse is happening everywhere all the time in the table, in your clothes, in your non in your body outside of the brain, everywhere. But generally, they're random and disconnected and. Here's a metaphor for you, okay? We call those proto-conscious. They're happening everywhere, but they don't amount to much. So if you go to the symphony and the orchestra is warming up, each instrument, each musician is playing his instrument uh, independent of the others, not even listening to the other ones. Now, e, uh, e, they're all making different sounds. It's not music. It's noise. It's, it's tone. You can think of each of those as a proto-conscious moment. And it's happening everywhere. It's, it's like the background noise. It just has some subjective component. Some of, the, some of those may have pleasure. Some of them may have pain. Some of them may any, anything in between. But they cancel out, and they don't amount to much. Now, the orchestra begins to play, and you have Beethoven's Fifth, or you have a rock and roll classic, or whatever, and that's music. But what the brain does, what the microtubules do, is take all those random proto-conscious moments and orchestrate them. All those random objective reduction OR mo moments and orchestrate them to give or OR. We have orchestrated objective reduction. Now, one of the other things I didn't say about Roger's objective reduction, going back to his 1989 book, was that, and, and remember, he needed something outside the system uh, that would explain consciousness. So if these collapses, when they do occur, uh, to either you know this state or that state were random, just like flipping a coin, which is what most people think. You know, Copenhagen and decoherence are random. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Born rule, uh, Max, uh, Max Born showing that collapse uh, is uh, the outcomes are random. Um, 
that, uh, you know, who cares uh, if, if they're just random. But what he said was that there's an influence from in features intrinsic to the universe, what he called platonic values, uh, from Plato's world of absolute form, that there's something intrinsic to the universe that had features and form and values and aesthetics and ethics and qualia, <clears throat> in other words, consciousness, but particularly uh, ethical values and aesthetic values. So this would be the Akashic record that comes into play only at the influence at the moment of collapse, but the collapse is, is ubiquitous and everywhere. And the more orchestrated, the more organized these objective reduction moments are, uh, the more um, uh, the platonic values come into play. Now, one way to, you know, if you want to take that in a religious sense, it's like divine guidance. If you let your, if you mindful and don't act rashly or reflexively, then you have those platonic values, these platonic values kick in and you act in a, in a, uh, in a, you know, ethical, aesthetic, uh, honorable way. Um, so it, it could also platonic, be, it could also be the flow state as well. Like how, how we get into that, into the zone or whatever. Yeah, I think the zone is, is, is a matter of shifting to the higher frequency. Right. Uh, but w whatever the frequency is occurring, uh, whatever uh, frequency you know, you're operating at, the, it's due to collapses, and those collapses can be influenced by the, the platonic values. But I think what you're saying is you can shift in that way so the platonic values kind of take over. And, and that could be, but it's like following the way of the Tao or the divine guidance or... or uh, um, Christ consciousness, right maybe, or yeah. <clears throat> so before we before we run out of time, I wanted to sort of ask you about the importance of this research as well. Like, there's the importance of it, you know, spiritually, and the importance of it um, to sort of fight the dogmatic materialist. But then there's also you guys are finding um, connections to Alzheimer's and memories and stuff like that too. And then have you also come across during your research like synesthesia, where people have their senses all uh, mixed up? or like locked up syndrome or other disorders that you've been able to identify the microtubules playing a role? Well, let me just stick to uh, Alzheimer's uh, for the time being, uh, and also brain trauma. So uh, in Alzheimer's, you have two different types of lesions. You have the amyloid plaques, which are these big globs of crap outside the neuron. Uh, and, uh, but they don't seem to cause that much problem. But then you have the, uh, the, neurofibrillary tangles inside the neuron. And uh, what those are, are this, this, so you have, you have microtubules that have microtubule-associated proteins, various types of them. And these maps, they're kind of like apps to a cell phone. We all have microtubules, we all have the same cell phone, but you have different apps than I do, so you do different things, and I do different things. Hmm. So the, the, the maps uh, do different things. Now, one of, the, one of the maps that's kind of an essential map is called tau. And tau does a couple of things. It kind of binds the microtubules together and stabilizes them. And it also acts as a traffic signal for motor proteins. So um, if you're going to, if you're going to regulate a synapse, uh, the, the material is, is, uh, is formed in the cell body and transported along the microtubule by these motor proteins, uh, which literally run along the microtubule. It's amazing if you've seen a video of this. And then uh, and in dendrites, the microtubules are, are disrupted in mixed polarity, so these motor proteins carrying in cargo to a specific synapse may ha have to jump from microtubule to microtubule and then come to a branch point and decide whether they go right and left, uh, the dendritic branching, and then uh, uh, deli finally deliver their cargo, and it's the tau protein that causes them to deliver their cargo to a particular area. So they're like traffic signals. So what happens in Alzheimer's disease is that the tau falls off the microtubules and the microtubules disintegrate. They, they depolymerize and you get clumps of this tau protein that are called neurofibrillary tangles in, in the uh, neuron. And then the microtubules are gone and the neuron shortens and you lose synapses. So it's a loss of the, uh, it's loss of the, the tau, the microtubules, and eventually synapses in neurons that uh, are associated with the cognitive defect in Alzheimer's disease. Now, uh, how we got, in, got interested in this is that when, when Audubon showed that my, the microtubules have all these resonances, it occurred to me that we ought to be able to interact, interface with them using some of these frequencies, if they're the resonant frequencies. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, infrared uh, 
or the terrorists is close to infrared, and a lot of people are putting infrared in the brain now, and yeah. actually showing interesting results. Yeah. Uh, then you have gigahertz, uh, which is microwaves, and some people have tried that. No, thank you. Um, and then uh, uh, next is megahertz. And megahertz is radio frequency waves. No, thank you there also. However, uh, when I was looking at this, um, megahertz is also, in mechanical vibrations, is ultrasound. And ultrasound has been used safely in medicine for 100 years. It passes through the body, reflects, echoes off surface, and you get an image. And so I wondered if anybody has tried, and at that point when I first read this in uh, 2012 or so, uh, you know, people have been doing transcranial direct current stimulation in the brain, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, different ways to affect brain function by putting, uh, and now photons into the brain. I wondered if anybody had been putting ultrasound in because it seemed that the ultrasound's been around. And sure enough, this guy, Jamie Tyler at ASU, had been doing it. And finding, he's in animals, finding behavioral and physiological effects. And uh, I said, and, and it proposed that it could be used for cognitive function and so forth. So I got in touch with him and uh, we became friends. And uh, eventually uh, uh, I wound up suggesting to my anesthesia colleagues. Now, we have ultrasound machines in the OR. We use them all the time for imaging to put in lines and so forth. So we're quite familiar. And uh, I said, we should try this on our chronic pain patients who are depressed. And they said to me, Hammer, that's my kind of nickname in the operating room. It's your idea. You got to shave. It's your idea. You got to shave, Ted. You go first. And uh, I thought about it and I looked up. I said, you know, this has been used in newborns to, to image, brain, image, look for bleeds, and it doesn't seem to harm them. It's been approved for brain imaging, but was, you know, forgotten about after CT and MRI. I said, it's been put in the brain. I said, well, what the hell? So in front of my friends sitting around, in the anesthesia library one late, one afternoon at the end of the day, I, I said, okay. So uh, I put the gel on, I put it to my head, and held it there for about, I don't know, 15 seconds. I, I didn't want to do it too long. I didn't feel a thing. And uh, I said, okay, I put it down. Well, that's too bad. But about a minute later, I got like a buzz. And I was <laughs> uh, highly energized and very creative and felt really good for about an hour. And so we eventually did a study in, <laughs> in early 2013, published, um, the first study of ultrasound, transcranial ultrasound, which I named TUS after the airport code for Tucson, um, showing uh, effects on mental states, improved mood in depressed patients. And, uh, and since then, there have been a couple studies from Australia showing ultrasound improves uh, symptoms and pathology in Alzheimer's in rats. And we're gearing up to do a study <laughs> on Alzheimer's patients. We did a pilot study over the summer with interesting results. And uh, we're going to look at developmental delay in kids also, <laughs> and also uh, brain trauma. So uh, stay tuned to that. We'll see how it goes. Meanwhile, they're, they're pouring, you know, all these drug studies on the amyloid goods don't work. Yeah, I thought, they were, finish- I thought they were doing some other research on Alzheimer's too with light, um, what was it? Was it light, light waves or light? In- uh, infrared photons, yeah. Is that uh, what it was? In- yeah. Yeah, infrared. We're going to have uh, a session at uh, the conscious conference in Shanghai on, uh, with uh, photon, uh, one guy on, on photons, one guy on transcranial magnetic, one guy on electrical, and one guy on ultrasound. Wow, and that's going to be at the on conference? <laughs> one guy on mushrooms. <laughs> Not in China. Oh, wow. Anyway, uh, yeah. let me, if we're running out of time, let me, uh, let me finish up on one thing. Yeah, I yeah. started talking about evolu- evolution before. So uh, I wrote this this chapter. Everybody thinks I'm crazy. In fact, Dave Chalmers said, people hate your quantum consciousness ideas. They're going to absolutely detest your quantum evolution ideas. I said, well, all well, days. Uh, I'm going to do it anyway. So um, so imagine these objective reductions, uh, a random proto-conscious moments are happening everywhere. And, uh, and if so, they would be there before life started. Now, everybody says, I said before, that you know, life formed, evolved, and then consciousness happened. There's consciousness, and that, that all this happens because of survival of the, of the fittest, survival of genes, gene survival. Uh, you know, the selfish gene idea of, of Dawkins. Yeah. To me, that makes no sense. I mean, why would an animal give a shit about anything, to do anything, without feeling? Except I mean, for any yeah, lab- pleasure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, why does a rat do anything in an experiment for reward, right? Why do we do anything for reward? 
not not always hedonistic reward, pleasure, but also altruism, spiritual bliss, love. It feels it feels better to give than to receive. But but pleasure and avoiding pain is is the origin of our behavior and all behavior, I would argue. So if consciousness, if if pleasure, so let's go back to these 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 little proto conscious moments. Um, some of them are going to be pleasurable. Um, so how did life evolve? Uh, how did life form? So there's this idea of the primordial suit uh, that was put out by Haldane and Operin in the 20s. The idea that life started in this mixture of chemicals with lightning. And uh, these guys in the 50s, uh, Harold Urey and, and Stanley Miller, reproduced the, um, the primordial soup in a, in a lab. And they put all the ingredients they knew were there, and they put sparks in for lightning. And at the end, they looked, and what they found was organic molecules, and specifically amphipathic molecules. Remember, we were talking about benzene before, the, mm-hmm. the aromatic ring with the pi resonance cloud, the, the lollipop of quantum, quantum stuff, um, of which dopamine is a, is a good example. They found exactly dopamine-like molecules, amphipathic, meaning nonpolar on one end and then a polar tail on the other. Now, if, if, and then Operin went on to, sh- uh, Operin who started the primordial soup idea showed that um, these uh, um, nonpolar groups, the oral like ends of the lollipops, would get together in the middle and the polar ends would stick out in what's, what he called a micelle. And actually, soap bubbles are very much like that, or soap molecules are very much, that's how they clean your soap. They, the oil binds the inner stuff and it makes it soluble and you wash it away. But he said that that was the origin of life, and that led to actual cells and uh, biological living cells. And um, and uh, that's how proteins form, as I said before. So inside proteins are these nonpolar pi resonance clouds, where water is excluded. They're called hydrophobic pockets in proteins, and that is exactly where anesthetics act in hydrophobic pockets of protein. Now, which proteins? Is another story. But it's uh, in microtubules. These nonpolar hydrophobic pockets connect to the tubular and tubular, and they form these helical pathways throughout the whole microtubule. So it gets very, very uh, uh, geometric and complicated and interesting. Um, but you get the same quantum underground in lipid membranes and in nucleic acids. So in all forms of biomolecules, the interior is conducive to quantum effects. Anyway, um, it occurred to me that back in the primordial soup, that some of the, that these my cells would start to get larger and larger and the quantum resonances among the pi groups would uh, would get more complex, and you'd start having these organized objective reductions, and some of them were going to be pleasurable, and that would be a feedback fitness function to cause the pi resonance, uh, these pi, the actual molecules, to, uh, their orientation to be optimal to maximize pleasure. In other words, the pleasure from some of these coalescence of dopamine-like pleasure molecules would would arrange themselves to optimize pleasure, and that life that these mole- these my cells and other organizations would get more and more complicated and 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 grow and differentiate and evolve just to optimize pleasure. And of course, along the way, they had to survive. They had a you know fight. They had a flood. Uh, they had a fight, they had to do whatever to survive so that they would optimize feeling good. So in other words, feeling good, uh, life evolved to feel good, and the brain evolved to feel good, not for complexity, but, and, and consciousness didn't, didn't emerge after a long time. Consciousness was there all along, and consciousness sparked the origin of life. And feelings drove its evolution and are still driving its evolution. Everything we do pretty much is, is to feel good one way or the other. So um, that's out there. I uh, uh, keep, you know, the, uh, so many people are invested in evolution that, you know, they don't like it, but they ignore consciousness. But um, that's, that's what I think about that anyway. Yeah. What do you think about wolfins? <laughs> We're all what? <laughs> Sorry. No, I, we won't get into that. Who did you say? I was talking with a friend a couple weeks ago about a wolf and like creature that dolphins and wolves came from. Wolves? Yes. Okay. Uh, maybe. I don't know. But I think, uh, you know, wolves and dolphins have microtubules. In fact, all animals have microtubules. And 
plants have microtubules, and uh, even uh, prokaryotes and archaeobacterium has something very, very, very much like microtubules. So I think microtubules came along to to uh, optimize uh, pleasure because they respond to just about every form of energy: ultraviolet, infrared, uh, thermal, uh, white noise. They turn it into coherence. Anand von Bandipati has a new paper about that, about how microtubules turn noise into music or noise into uh, into life or consciousness, or whatever you want to say. Wow. So uh, yeah, so I think that's that's where it's all coming from. Do plants have equal amount or more or less? Or what's that? Do plants have an equal amount or more or less? Fewer, like one microtubule per cell. Huh. And what do we have? We had like ninety-six billion. Uh, per, we have, if you count the uh, the individual tubulins, we have uh, a, a billion per neuron. Plant and ninety-six have, billion well, neurons. 86, yeah. 80. yeah. So does that mean that we have to get our computer calculations to do 86 billion times 86 billion calculations, and then we're okay? <laughs> well, if you want to look at the brute force calculation, uh, it would be, um, it would be uh, 10 to the 16th operations times the number of neurons, uh, which is 10 to the 27th. So that's the number of calculations, if that's all it were. But I would argue that wouldn't do squat because, in terms of consciousness, because you need collapse. And so I think, and I think the more you have, the faster you can reach critical threshold. You know that movie Lucy, where she is only losing a using a small fraction of her brain, and, uh, and Morgan Freeman, uh, and she used more and more, and she kind of went they got all the superpowers. Yeah, yeah. And people say we only. We only use a small fraction of our brain. I don't think that's true. I think actually, so let, let me go back a little bit. I was saying before that that Roger and I first suggested that uh, uh, we had a, a maintain co- coherence for 25 milliseconds uh, to account for gamma synchrony EEG uh, 40 hertz oscillations. In our recent papers in 2014 and 2016, uh, we had we took a different approach because since we now know about the megahertz oscillations, the faster vibrations in microtubules. And since the microtubules in dendrites, particularly in pyramidal cells, which give rise to EEG, um, are interrupted and of mixed polarity. So you have one microtubule next to another going in opposite direction, which means that if they're both resonating, they're going to have slightly different frequencies, and they're going to have B frequencies. They're going to give these harmonics, these negative harmonics that will cascade to give EEG. So it occurred to us that if the OR, if the OR moments are happening not at 25 milliseconds, but at 10 megahertz, which is uh, you know millionths of a second, it's a lot easier to avoid decoherence. It made our argument from the physics standpoint much, much, much easier because you only have to uh, avoid decoherence for a millionth of a second instead of a fortieth of a second, uh, and maybe even less if you want to go if you want to go to the, the gigahertz. So it, it made that argument very, e- very easy, and it explained how EEG could be B frequencies of microtubules. Um, so the faster you go, the, the deeper you go, and more conscious you are, I would say. So how does this affect us, like regular day to day people, and and spiritual, spiritually? Um, you know the importance of this this research and this sort of theory as opposed to our materialistic one? Well, I think if you, you know, if you uh, meditate or pray or, or become one with the universe or whatever state does it for, whatever you want to call it, the flow state, um, I think you're shifting to a higher frequency and you're, you're, you're more involving space-time geometry and less of the material world. So you're going deeper into the quantum world, uh-huh. deeper into space-time geometry. And, uh, you know, uh, space-time geometry itself is a frac- it seems to be fractal at, at multiple frequencies. And, uh, you know, if you go down in scale from atoms or quarks or whatever, you go down and down and down, it, eventually uh, you reach the Planck scale, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, which seems to be the bottom line, where there is information. And how that information gets upward is is not is not understood, but it could be kind of like a fractal repeating every three every three orders of magnitude or so, 
And it could be that as as our as we go deeper into the state, as we be, as we meditate or or go further that way, we go deeper into this uh, quantum state, into space time geometry, and less in the material world. And this would account for, as I said before, yogis who their metabolism slow down or they don't appear to be there, but they're actually deeply conscious. Or the people in the MRI scanner and the psilocybin who's outwardly, outwardly their brains look like they're, they're on vacation, but actually they're highly conscious because their conscious has gone to a deeper level. <clears throat> so I think <clears throat> when you meditate or become one with the universe, however you do it, you're quite literally doing that. You're going into this deeper level and, uh, and shifting more into the, uh, towards the plank scale. Yeah, that makes sense. It's so nice to hear it in, in, in that scientific term, right? In that scientific way. Like it does, it, it seems to me like it's easier to grasp now if, if there's little, some theories behind it. <clears throat> so, well, I think, you know, don't, don't, don't be bullied. Uh, and I, I just give you my, you know, you can't, you can't be bullied by these scientists and materialists who have this haughty, these haughty attitudes that, uh, you know, just ask them, well, how do you explain consciousness in the brain? If they say, well, it's an emergent property, you know, what's the evidence of that? How would you even test it? And basically it's bullshit. And, uh, you know, it, it, see, it, you know, you do all this brain mapping and you can't, and yet you've got a worm and you can't, you, you map the, the entire brain of the worm. It doesn't do anything. And you got a paramecium, which is one bit according to you, and it's more clever than a lot of people I know. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think, uh, these guys are blowing smoke and, uh, you know, they're getting, they're making billions out of this brain mapping, which is a boondoggle. And, uh, you know. Well, there might be other, there maybe there'll be other uses for that brain mapping. I mean, <clears throat> I don't it know. It could be. It could yeah. be. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. But uh, in terms of, you know, the essence, uh, finding the essence of the brain, I mean, they're only looking skin deep. They're only looking at the neuronal level. They're not looking, you know, it would be like a doctor look, being only a dermatologist and not knowing anything about the heart or the lungs or the or your spinal cord or your brain, for that matter. Yeah, that's what they're doing. They're looking strictly at the membrane and the synapse, and they're going, "What's going on?" I mean, how do they know the microchips aren't involved? They go, and there's actually good evidence for it. And maybe this is the last thing I should say. I've been, you know, anesthesia has been a big mystery and something I, you know, how it works. And we know that the potency of the gas anesthetics correlate with its solubility in this pi resonance quantum underground in hmm. protein. The question is, which proteins? And it was always thought that it was membrane proteins, like receptors for serotonin, acetylcholine, glycine, or GABA, an inhibitory protein. And yet, uh, uh, effects on those proteins are all over the place. They go up, they go down, there's no consistency. Anyway, about 10 years ago, a guy at the University of Pen Pennsylvania, Rod Eckenhoff, started doing this systematically, and he found that anesthesia binds to 74 different proteins in a neuron, about half in the membrane, half in the cytoplasm, including microtubules, including tubulin. He then did uh, genomic and proteomic uh, work that showed that the functional effect was on tubulin, on microtubules. And he then did a subsequent study where uh, he showed with a fluorescent anesthetic that the act, action of anesthetics is on microtubules, pretty uh, in tadpoles. But anesthesia works on all animals, so I think the evidence actually points to microtubules. Now, you know, people are ignoring it because they're, they're hung up on this membrane protein idea, but there's no evidence. So I think, you know, at least I think the evidence now points to and will continue to point to in the future anesthesia acting in the quantum underground and microtubules. We have a paper on that, uh, out on that. We're working on a couple more. So stay tuned to that one. Too. Yeah, nice. So are you are you speaking anywhere coming up in any conferences? And then and then you also have your your regular conference that you guys do. Uh, that's going to be in China, hopefully this year, right? Yeah, uh, I just got back uh, from uh, Europe and spoke at, at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. And uh, attended the uh, uh, the announcement and the, uh, the launch of the Roger Penrose Institute in London with uh, James Tag and Betsy Bigby and uh, Roger Penrose, and uh, it was quite a thrill. And the press release this one I'll send you the uh, the press release, and um, we're looking forward to that. And uh, uh, yeah, and. Uh, um, China, and then after that, you know, who knows? Lots of other stuff. Yeah. But uh, mostly right now, I'm excited about the Penrose Institute and getting that going. Uh, that'll be really exciting, and we hope to repeat. Uh, we hope to do Honor Bond's work uh, over there. Look at the quantum resonances and microchips. It's kind of the, you know, there's all kinds of institutes uh, following the AI brain mapping idea, 
and they have a lot of money. The Paul Allen Institute, where Christoph Koch works, has uh, ridiculous amounts of money. Um, map the map the mouse cortex, um, and you know, like you said, they're finding all kinds of interesting things. But in the end, as far as, you know, it's just skin deep. They're not they're not going to find consciousness. I mean, uh, I could be wrong, but um, you know, I'll, well, let's wait and find out. And all kinds of other ones uh, institutes based on this idea at Salk and Scripps and here and there everywhere, but, um, and there's a lot of money behind it. And the Penrose Institute is kind of the antidote to all those, because they're all following the same party line. Brain is a computer, neurons are switches, bits. We get enough uh, uh, computer power, we'll have the brain. I say bullshit. And we need new ideas, and those new ideas uh, have emanated mostly from Roger Penrose beginning in 1989, not only in consciousness, but also in cosmology, in, uh, in, uh, in the origin of the universe, he thinks that the Big Bang was preceded by another eon, which was preceded by another one. Uh, it could be that the universe is actually evolving uh, Big Bang to Big Bang, uh, uh, merging general relativity, using uh, sensors to detect uh, gravity waves. Uh, Yvette Fuentes uh, uh, is a physicist who will be uh, in the Institute, and she's developing Bose-Einstein condensate to detect uh, gravity waves, which could be used to uh, probe the universe, look for dark matter, and also look in the Earth's crust to look for uh, earthquakes, uh, early detect to predict earthquakes. So there's lots of po possible spin-offs, and we hope to develop those based on Roger's ideas. And they all go against the grain of mainstream physics and, and mainstream neuroscience and mainstream philosophy. But all those things that have really um, have really failed to answer the deep questions, and he has. He's a courageous thinker, and uh, um, he has developed these ideas. And uh, I'll send you the uh, the press release, and hopefully you'll send it to your listeners. Yeah, for sure we um, will, yeah. yeah. So it's an exciting time. Yeah, good luck with uh, good luck with all that, the Penrose Institute, and we'll check back in and see how it's going. And, and we we definitely want to thank you for all your time you spent here today. It was uh, fascinating. My mind is my mind is blown. <laughs> Hi, Graham, Darren. Nice talking to you guys. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was awesome. Thanks for coming and, along. Uh, you're very welcome. And uh, stay in touch and uh, catch you later. Okay, buddy. Down the road. Okay, thanks. Take it easy. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. And that was our chat with the one and only Stuart Hammerhoff. You know, what's funny is what the bleep to me, we knew I remember watching that like fucking way before I was into any of this shit. Yeah. It was, was a it a seed? Jig, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember that. Was it a seed planted? Uh, yeah, maybe. I remember it stuck with me for sure. Yeah, for I think I saw it with my sister. Back then, like, I don't even think I had a computer yet, you know? Like, we rented it at oh, the wow. video store. Yeah. And, like, I think, I don't think if I, if I had a computer and internet at that time, it was pretty, you know, I wasn't doing much with it. I saw it in the theater. Online dating. I saw it in the theater. Did you? Yeah. What sort of theater? Just movie theater. Just a regular one? Yeah, pretty huh. much. You were, a, you were in a hipster then. I'm, what, are you, what are you saying? No, I was, I've never been a, a hipster. Yeah, big thanks to Stuart for coming to the show. Yeah, that was uh, fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's always uh, good when you only ask like four questions in span of two hours and just kind of sit there with your jaw on the table. Yeah, so I wanted to get a little bit more into the motions and how that uh, that helps when I was researching his, his work. It seemed to be that uh, that was a key key point. But he's your best not to interrupt. Yeah, in my experience. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> and big thanks, to, big thanks to Stuart. Big thanks to you guys. Of course, our subscribers. We've got a few more. We could always use more and more of those. Um, to help us keep having these chats with no commercials, no bullshit. Richard, or uh, sorry, Stuart can come on here and just go for two hours. No commercials. We don't have to stop him. We don't have to break up his thoughts. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it kind of lets us keep going with that style where we don't have to cram questions in and we can just let these guys go. So big thanks to our supporters who let us do that. Uh, check out gramerica.ca slash support for all the different ways you can do that. Uh, there's a bunch of different month monthly options there. You can start at a buck and, you know, kind of work your way up as you go. Um, and if you can't support monetarily, of course, there's, uh, you know, 20 other ways. Yeah, 
You can connect with us too through Instagram and Twitter and Google Hangouts. Do you want to explain that? I think we'll get into that in the intro. Okay. Like by the time this comes out, we'll have gotten into that. Okay. So okay. all the link now by now the link for the Google Hangouts should be in the show notes. Okay. Which so far is pretty cool. Like say Graham and I won't always be in there. We'll we'll check in from time to time. It'd eventually be cool to have, you know, a few hundred members so that it's like, you know, you could be sitting in an airport and just sort of pop in there and there'll be a couple other you know, you shoot out a message and there's a couple other board guy Americans that'll entertain each other. Yeah, we'll have to explain that a little Network bit more. Network and, and all that fun stuff. Because so. what you're talking about is an app on the phone, right? Like a chat app? That's right. <clears throat> yeah. Cool. Yeah, so big thanks, Stuart. Big thanks to you guys. Uh, hope you enjoyed it uh, as much as we did. And thanks for listening, guys. We will see you next week. Sense of the world only if... We base the world on consciousness. World is made of consciousness. World is consciousness. Consciousness is the sense of the world only if we base the world on consciousness. World is made of consciousness. World is consciousness. Consciousness is the sense of the world only if we base the world on consciousness. World is made of consciousness. World is consciousness.
you look down. Expand that consciousness. Consciousness, creativity in the brain. of the world only if we base the world on consciousness. World is made of consciousness, world is consciousness. Consciousness is the ground of being. Make sense of the world only if we base the world on consciousness. World is made of consciousness, world is consciousness. If they make you laugh, if they make you cry, if they blow your mind. 